Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University and the 2023 Larry Swanson Environmental Symposium. My name is Frank Rothelm, Director of the Waste and Conduct and Management here at Stony Brook. And it's my pleasure this time to introduce the Dean, Paul Shepson, to get this program started. Jeff? Okay. So welcome to the Larry Swanson Long Island Environmental Symposium. It's a pleasure to have everyone here today. Who knew that waste management was such a hot topic here on Long Island? Yes, we all knew that, right? Here at SOMAS, it's uh, at the very foundation of everything we do, starting with studying and working to mitigate the causes of climate change, which derive from incomplete management of the products of combustion in the form of CO2. And along with CO2, there's one of my sort of favorite molecules, methane that derives in part from the not imperfect management of food waste, moral and ethical dilemma for all of us. We should work hard to minimize food waste for sure. So climate change affects now most everything that we do. And yet here in New York State, we are leading Statewide, we're leading in the country and we're leading in the world in efforts to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change through reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, through the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that was co-authored by our, our, uh, our friends uh, Todd uh, Kaminsky and Steve Engelbright. 2019. Um, we also have huge challenges related to the imperfect management, it's kind of an understatement, but the imperfect management of human waste leading to nitrogen runoff into our bays that, that contributes to harmful algae blooms. And yet, here on Long Island, with the help of lots of friends, and scientists at SOMAS, we have completely cleaned up at least the East Bay of Shinnecock Bay. Through the Shinnecock uh, Bay Restoration Program, we're really proud of what we have done there. It has shown us that, that we can do better through hard work and uh, teamwork. Um, so here in SOMAS, uh, as I said, waste reduction and management is at the heart of what we do with our students and our faculty and staff and great people like uh, Frank Ruthell. Um, and so we will continue to lead with this substantial challenge for Long Island. So back in the, the day, not too long ago, I learned what it means to be a gentleman from this person, Larry Swanson, for whom we're all sorry he's not with us anymore, but certainly with us in spirit. I work hard every day to live up, to try to live up to the standard that he set for us. And I'm sure that everyone here will, will continue in Larry's uh, tradition uh, of being a good human being. So uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I let you have at it, and uh, it's going to be a great morning. So thank you for letting me say a few remarks, and it's an honor to be here with you.
Now we're ready to start the program. And our moderator for the first session is Jim Heil. Jim? Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, friends of, friends of solid waste. We're newly gathered here to learn great and wondrous things and to solve all the problems of solid waste on Long Island. So, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, pointed to uh, the two, uh, the Larry's picture and the Evans picture. Uh, I grew up with both of them, and they're uh, they're both great guys, great guys. And we pleasure to honor their memory. Uh, the topic of the first uh, session is financial opportunities for new solid waste management infrastructure. And I I looked at that and I cringe because I'm not sure there's any new solid waste infrastructure or if there's any money for solid waste infrastructure. But we shall be optimistic. And uh, our first speaker was scheduled to be Rick McCarthy, president of Environmental Capital Associates, uh, which is a private, uh, which is a, a company that does uh, analysis of projects, economic analysis, independent, uh, analysis of, the, of municipal projects. The take a position, just looks at all the numbers and whispers to the to his, uh, his uh, boss, you know, it's a good project, do it. Yeah. And uh, we, I work with Rick on uh, computer projects, Hempstead Waste Energy, uh, kind of on a bird project, and uh, his analysis is good, straightforward, and importance, especially in being able to sell bonds, because the independent financial analysis was critical for uh, getting a good rate for the, for the bonds for the projects. So, unfortunately, I was in conversation with Rick yesterday afternoon, giving him directions, you know, wishing him well on his trip, and I get here this morning, and um, Mike Cahill said he, he sprained his leg, it's a lot of pain, and it's going to the doctor this morning. So I called Rick and I said, you better be here this afternoon then. <laughs> so he said he's gonna try. So in his stead, Mike Cahill has his overheads, and we'll make do, we'll do the presentation for Rick, for opportunities for municipalities in the Inflation Reduction Act. Mike? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not Rick McCarthy. Uh, my name is Mike Cagle. I'm uh, the chair of the uh, Evan Midland Scholarship Fund uh, Steering Committee. I've been uh, honored enough to, to be involved with this the Midland Fund for about 10 years now, or maybe 13. Um, we uh, have been awarding scholarships to uh, graduate students and undergraduate students in uh, at Stony Brook for the last 25 years, and uh, we're in our 26 now. Recently, we've begun to uh, uh, host uh, symposiums of this kind uh, that have something to do with solid waste. I think this is our third or fourth, and um, we're all very pleased that uh, we have such a crowd here. It was uh, kind of stunned us uh, when we first uh, you know, floated the idea that we might talk about uh, solid waste. Uh, with the upcoming closure of the Brookhaven landfill and the challenges that face the region. Uh, and the uh, response was uh, startlingly uh, fast and large. Uh, we had never had it this, we've never had a crowd this size and um, I think it reflects the, uh, you know, the interest now and the concerns that uh, many of us have about uh, where we're going with solid waste. So um, I had asked Rick, uh, if he could uh, address us uh, first to talk about the uh, financial situation and the opportunities that may be present with the uh, adoption of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, by the federal government recently. And he was uh, more than willing, and, and he's a very knowledgeable guy. Uh, I am not. Uh, so I have his, own, I have his slides. Uh, I will try to walk through them and point out the uh, potentials 
that are there, but don't take anything I say seriously. <laughs> don't go back home and uh, put a new revenue line in the budget for next year, just based on what you hear today. But uh, I think you'll find that it's, a, it's an interesting uh, bill and it does present a, a number of opportunities for municipalities and the private sector to help fund new solid waste projects. And as such, you know, it's something of, of interest to everyone. So I'm going to try to uh, go through this as, as clearly as I possibly can, but it may not be uh, something that you, uh, that you may not you may not leave here today fully aware of what the Inflation Reduction Act can do, but it's a tip off to find somebody who does know. Okay. Anyway, um, we have a very large bill here. This was uh, 370 billion dollars uh, from the White House and. Uh, as Rick says, McKinsey says it's really worth $500 billion in funding. Its main focus is, the, uh, uh, is energy, moving from fossil fuels to uh, better make greenhouse gases to clean energy. And um, it's interesting because there's one big change. Much of this still uh, provides new tax credits for projects that are developed. And of course, those apply to the private sector. If you're going to build something, uh, you get from this bill the ability to take uh, credits on your taxes. Um, and but the, the main thing that changes is in past bills like this or past programs like this, uh, local governments were kind of uh, left out because they don't pay taxes. And here, uh, the Congress changed that. While the private sector can get tax credits, the municipalities that build projects can get direct payments from the federal government up to some pretty significant sums. Um, and they can, you can, the municipalities can get the, get the direct payment or they can sell the credit to somebody else. Um, the uh, types of uh, programs that are here are um, for production tax credits, you can get three cents a kilowatt hour on any electricity, clean energy that you generate, and uh, 0.3 cents. And if you build in an area where you can um, meet Davis-Bacon uh, minimum wage, which is about uh, pretty similar to our own Department of Labor prevailing wage, and you can have apprenticeships, uh, you can get five times that much, 1.5 cents a kilowatt. That adds up to quite a bit. And if you're a municipality in New York, you know already that you're probably, if you're going to build, you're going to you know, comply with prevailing wage, and you're very likely going to have an apprenticeship program or six uh, on the job that you do. So that, that funding is there and could be with uh, an investment tax credit. You can get 6% of the investment back as a credit or back as a direct payment. Or you can get up to 30% back as a payment or back as a credit in, uh, if you comply with wage and, and apprenticeship rules. That's something that's big. 30% of a project is a lot of money. And it's, a, it's the kind of thing that uh, you need to, uh, to look at closely. And it, it, what it does, I think, is uh, spurs municipalities to start thinking, if we're going to build, this may be a very good time to do it, as long as this bill is in, is in effect. Now, the credits that the Inflation Reduction Act provide uh, eventually uh, phase out. So they are in effect till uh, the later of 2032, 10 years, 10, nine years from now, or the date on which uh, the electric power sector emits 75% less carbon than it did in 2022. Now, around in New York and around the country, the, uh, the growth of renewable energy is proceeding quickly. That may happen uh, pretty soon. So one has to keep an eye on not only what you're going to build, what you might be able to get in credits, but how how much you may be, how much uh, you may be able to use them before time runs out. So it's a it's a timing thing as well as a substantive. It's not here forever, and but it is here now. Uh, we have a 
have production tax credits, which um, qualifying facilities are wind, solar, geothermal, incremental hydropower, <coughs> marine and hydrokinetic, biomass, or municipal solid waste, including landfill gas. So for Long Island and for New York, we have not just, you know, uh, assistance to expand landfill gas facilities at the various landfills we have around the state, but also to help support new biogas projects that can be created and potentially even waste energy facilities because in the federal system, waste energy, electric, electricity produced by waste energy is considered renewable. It's not considered renewable in New York, but it is considered renewable by the federal government. Now, that may or may not take place, but it is, it is the language in the law is there. And the other thing to remember about this act is that uh, it's early. Uh, there are gonna be regulations adopted and amended for the distribution of these funds. And there's gonna be guidance adopted and put into place for the applications uh, and where it could be used. Now that stuff isn't happening yet. The guidance is not due until 2020. Five, the EPA is working on it. It's going to be something that you have to keep an eye on as that stuff sort of thing develops. And we'll be able to say, to see in about a year or two just exactly what projects are best suited for funding through this end. Okay. Um, clean energy production tax credit. Um, and use, it could be applied to carbon capture, utilization, and storage uh, for, uh, to, re, you know, to reach qualifying emission levels. And this is the provision that uh, gives you 3.3 cents a kilowatt hour for 10 years, grossed up to 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour uh, with wage and apprenticeship requirements. Now, again, it phases out uh, in maybe 10 years, um, depending on how quickly we, uh, we achieve goals uh, for energy. But, um, you know, the, the, uh, the cost of electricity or the price that's paid to, for electricity that's generated by solid waste facilities around New York varies widely. On Long Island, we currently have at the waste energy facilities the best contracts in the state. We get the, the waste energy in, in Long Island gets 7.9 cents a uh, kilowatt hour generated from LIPA. Okay, that is a fixed fee that goes until 2027. It ends in 2027, and uh, some new arrangement will have to be made with LIPO in order to keep generating power. Um, and uh, that hasn't happened yet. So we've got you know, four years to work that out. In addition, upstate, it's not so much. Uh, that The price paid for electricity upstate is um, tied to the uh, NISO uh, day ahead market. So at best it's three cents, at worst it's a, a penny, a kilowatt hour. It doesn't support the waste energy and the cost of those, those facilities. But if you can get 7.9 cents, and even more, uh, I think, significantly, if we remember back in the day, in the late 80s, in the mid 80s, when FERC, uh, first started to propose waste to energy to uh, local governments across the country. There was a guarantee of six cents a kilowatt hour to be paid for the power that was generated by those facilities. That was uh, phased out and uh, left us in the early 90s uh, with, budget, with budget changes. But on Long Island, the facilities that we built had contracts and that floor was there. There was, uh, that was being negotiated and we ended up with 7.9. But if you go back to 1985 and you take your, you know, internet calculator and apply the CPI to six cents in 1985, you would find that if, you know, it had been applied all those years till today, it would be 16 cents a kilowatt hour. 16 cents a kilowatt hour would translate the 7.9 cents at the ice facility, because I'm familiar with that one, it turns out to be about $25 a ton for all the ways it goes through. Uh, 16 cents 
would take us up to 50,000 ton for all the waste that goes through. 16 cents with a new boiler, as has been developed in other parts of the world, could take you up to $110 a ton for, for the waste that goes through the front door. That is something I think that is the key to further development of, of energy from waste facilities. The energy price is what's going to make the difference. $110 a ton off the top makes any of these facilities competitive with export. And that's what we have to be looking at going forward. How much are we going to be exporting? How much are we going to be handling at home? Energy price is going to be the <coughs> probable key to whether we do it or we don't do it. Another uh, ex extension of the energy, energy investment track tax credit, which your accountant may know about, but I don't. And I'm going to go beyond that one. Um, <laughs> the energy investment tax credit, again, it's 6% six, six of credit on the investment. Just right off the bat, you can get that back as a direct payment or as a tax credit. <coughs> if you comply on the facility with wage and apprenticeship requirements, you can work with 30% of the capital cost, and you can transfer it. Um, these are the, this slide is just what the, uh, what the, what the basic requirements are. Again, pay Davis Bacon wages, that's federal minimum wage. It's very similar, I think, and may even be recognized by the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor standards may be recognized for Davis Bacon purposes, but even if they're not, they're pretty close. And uh, apprenticeship, would be uh, a minimum percentage of, uh, of uh, total hours done by apprentices and percentage varies on the uh, year when construction starts. So there's lots of detail to look at, which I can't tell you about, but somebody else possibly can. <coughs> okay. And then there are, are additional uh, benefits for siting facilities in energy communities uh, and uh, Bonuses for siting in low-income residential buildings or uh, low-income communities that are on tribal land. Uh, and a number of environmental justice provisions are in the bill that you know provide opportunities and requirements. Um, it is something again that uh, you know I won't be able to give you much detail on, but um, uh, we have. Finally, at the end, in that bill as well, there are a number of uh, benefits for uh, production of uh, commercial vehicles, which in our world would be uh, electric garbage trucks. Um, payment of 30% of the cost, a uh, limit of 7,500 per, per vehicle with a gross weight up to 14,000 pounds, and um, over, over 14,000 pounds, a big truck, $40,000. That helps too. These things are there to, uh, assist the transition in our collection fleets. You know, as you know, in, uh, in Long Island, we've gone from diesel to compressed natural gas. Next step uh, would be electric. And uh, there are a variety of uh, different departments of New York City is, is uh, experimenting with some electric vehicles. And I think other Long Island towns are uh, looking at them at least, if not putting them in the, you know, on the highway, but they're coming. And this is a, uh, this is a, me uh, a mechanism that will help municipalities pay for these things. So that's the end. That's all I can tell you. I'm not, uh, like I say, uh, all that conversant in all of this, but if anybody has any questions, um, I'll take them, whatever I can, the best, I'll answer as best I can if you got one. Anybody? Yes. What do you, so uh, I know that you, you don't have a lot of knowledge on it, but uh, for the municipalities, the grants, is there any information you know about that? Nope. The grant part? Nope. No idea. No idea. Let's go back home and uh, call up somebody who does know. Okay. Okay. But Rick McCarthy is the guy to find. You know, okay. He does know about this. I wish he was here. Um, you may see him at the Sagamore if you go up there in, uh, in May. Uh, but, uh, you know, try your, you could start with your accountant. Okay. Anybody else? All right, then. Thank you very much. And Jim, where are you? Here I am. Okay. Okay.
Our next presenter is a person, wonderful person that I think everybody in the room knows and will have a variety of opinions. Uh, I've known Adrian for a long time uh, on both sides of the table. Uh, we worked together at the Brookhaven National Lab on the Citizens Advisory Council. Uh, she's faced me on a number of occasions when we talk about big garbage projects, and uh, it's always been a clean fight. So <laughs> I appreciate her coming today. Adrian Esposito is the executive director of the Citizens Campaign for the Environment. This uh, group has been around for about 38 years. I don't see how Adrian does it. She's only 21, True. but uh, well, the spirit of 21. And uh, she does great work and the, uh, the campaign does good work, uh, uh, especially uh, her assistant Maureen, who I've known also for a number of years. So Adrian is gonna discuss Pathway to reduce waste, increase recycling, and save municipalities money. All within 10 minutes. That's right. Okay. Then I can do Adrian, it. Adrian, thank you. So I don't have a presentation. And can you guys hear me or should I use the mic? Never a problem. Never a problem. <laughs> no, the mic is better. Okay. This one so you can walk around. Uh, no, I'll just use this. Take a seat. Okay. So. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I know that earlier James Hill said the, the issue of the cost of infrastructure um, makes him cringe, and we don't want to have Jim cringe. So let's talk about something that's been going on for 10 years, but really uh, this year for the first time, actually for the second time, uh, actually is, has a real possibility of getting passed in Albany, something that's going to have meaning for every single individual, but also for every single municipality across the state of New York. It's called Extended Producer Responsibility. That's a terrible name. The governor's asked us to rebrand it this year, so now we have to call it Waste Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act. It rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> so the Waste Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act is actually a new way of doing business in America, but we're going to focus here on New York. This is a program that has already passed four states in the nation, California, Colorado, Maine, and Oregon. New York would be the fifth, but there are several states now looking at this legislation. I'm just going to walk over to them. Okay. Um, the program is successful in Europe and actually almost every province in Canada. What is it, you might be asking? Well, some of you already know. I know Will Flowers has been lobbying on this, so many of us already know. Uh, this is a program where we reverse it. Instead of the cost and the burden of recycling placed on municipalities, it puts it on the manufacturers and the producers of the waste in the first place. See, head shaking, we like that. They're shaking like this, in case you want to know. Um, but what it does is that on the producers and manufacturers of products, so whether it's making cereal boxes or whether it's making you know, your laundry detergent, giant plastic, they have to pay a fee. It's a very tiny fee based on the amount of waste they produce in the end product after the product is used. So think about Amazon, think about you know, Walmart, Target, everybody who ships things. You know how you get the box in the box in the box and the plastic in the plastic in the plastic? You all know what's the biggest growing part of the waste stream? Cardboard, exactly. Feels like I know the answer. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is there's more shipping. And what happens? Who pays? We pay, right? All the municipalities pay. This program establishes what's called a producer responsibility organization or a PRO. The PRO collects the fees from the manufacturers and the producers. And the fees are tied to how much waste they produce. So the less waste they produce, the less they pay. The more recyclable the materials they use, the less they pay. And the more recycled content they use, the less they pay. All of that money goes into a fund. Then what happens to the fund? The fund gets distributed to municipalities, all of you, Rich, um, to then purchase, Rich is like, all right, I like this bill, um, to then purchase 
uh, recycling infrastructure, do recycling education, increase recycling, thereby also driving down waste. We don't agree on much sometimes uh, in New York, but I think the one thing we do agree on, one of the things we all agree on, is waste reduction is a good way to manage waste, is to just reduce it and also increase the recyclability of what is produced. You know, people talk about zero waste, we all agree, but we're not getting there tomorrow. So we all, we will have waste. People will buy products, right, in this society. So we have to be more cognizant of what is, uh, what are they contained in those products? And as I said, this um, program works in, for instance, British Columbia. They now have a 75% recycling rate, um, which is pretty darn good. They haven't been implemented in the other states that I spoke about because they actually just passed in the last year or two. It takes a year or two to get this program up and running. So this year, we've been working on this bill really stead in a steadfast fashion for three years. We're working on the concept for 10 years, not new. No, we've working on this, con thank you, Ken. this concept for 10 years, and we're working on this legislation for three years. And right now we have, and we almost got it done last year. Uh, we had a uh, we had negotiation, a pre rate negotiation between the Senate, the Assembly, and the Governor's Office in the last three days before uh, session negotiations stopped. This year we started really early, out of the gates, and we're happy to tell you the governor has an, I'm going to call it EPR for this crowd if you don't mind. The governor has an EPR bill in her budget. Senator Harkham introduced an uh, EPR bill. And last week, Assemblywoman Glick, who's the new NCON chair in the Assembly, introduced the same as Senator Harkham's bill in the Assembly. So having a same as bill in the Assembly and in the Senate and one in the governor's budget is pretty darn good. Yesterday in the Senate budget that was released, they included it as part of their budget bill, which we're happy. And now we're working on the assembly. So all of that is to say is that we're making a lot of progress this year on the political front, but it's a complicated bill, right? The bill talks about putting that money on producers. Producers, some of them don't like it. Some of them actually do like it. I mean, I, I got an email from Coca-Cola last week saying, how can we help? I normally don't get emails from Coca-Cola saying, how can I help? <laughs> not, not a normal thing in our circle. Um, but, you know, many, many companies realize that this is the wave of the future. It's working in Europe. Europe doesn't have landfill space. All right. So they're not just throwing the garbage in a landfill. They're really, really steadfast about waste reduction and reducing it. That's why they got on board with extended producer responsibility. Um, so I think a lot of industries feel like, okay, this is going to happen. It's happening you know, around the world. It's going to happen in America. How can I be part of this? I have to do as little as possible. No, I don't, I don't really think I've been thinking that, but I feel like it. Um, so they are really not opposing these bills, but they are trying to change them and change the language. The bills also have goals of how much recycled material should be used in products by each year, and also how much should we increase recycling by each year, um, and how much post-consumer recycled waste should be used as well. So this is something you're gonna hear a lot about. There's been op-eds in the paper. Um, there's been lots of media coverage on it. But for the first time, I think it really uh, gives incentives. And this is the key for us. This is one of the main reasons you know, we think this is work, uh, can work, it gives incentives to producers to right size their products. And by right size, I mean, you know, you go to the grocery store, you get a cereal box that contains, could contain 20 ounces of your Cheerios, but it really only has 15 ounces. But why is it so big? Because we, the consumer, think we're getting more for $2.79. So it's a marketing thing to make the box bigger. Make the plastic bigger. Make it look bigger for us. Because we think bigger means more, but not in reality. This is a bill that will cause the producer to say, bigger costs me more. I got to put it down to the right size now. And that is helpful. There's no incentive right now for them to use recyclable materials. You know this. 
Yogurt could be in a root, number one, and number two, and number three, and number four, and number five, and number six. It could be in anything. Why isn't it standardized? It makes it easier for recycling programs. It'll certainly make it easier for the public. The public, we know, many times is looking at these products, and nobody over 40 can see what that symbol says. <laughs> you have to go get the, you put them on not that i can relate to this and then you look again and then you have to put it under the light because it's glaring <laughs> by that time they're just making decision to put it in the recycling bin because it's probably recycling and all, we all like yes i know and, but you all know that maybe it's not or maybe that this powder doesn't recycle that number so we believe that this program unifies it, will make it easier for the public, will improve recycling rates, will improve our ability to recycle as municipalities, will reduce waste and reduce taxes. The last thing I'm gonna say about this program, we've been in our coalition, we have New York City, we have the coalition of counties, we have the coalition of villages, and we have these environmental groups with Jim Heal seems to think are so controversial. And yet we're not. When you sit there in the lobby with New York City and you're all agreeing, uh, why? Why are we agreeing? It's going to save money and it's going to save the environment. We like those two combinations. And New York City said, and I just was with them on Friday. We actually toured the Sims facility. If you haven't been there, it's pretty amazing. Um, they separate out all of New York City's recyclables. There's giant rats too, but anyway. Um, and then we were with uh, the new Assemblywoman Glick, with uh, who's the new Encon Chair, EPC Commissioner of Sagos, and we uh, really got a firsthand look at how it operates, but also to talk about what this program would mean for New York City. They're saying at a minimum, a minimum, it's going to save them between 150 and 160 million per year. A minimum. That's real money. Real money that they could do other things with, like, you know, add to the police force, fix roads, whatever it is they want to do, quality of life issues. So the other municipalities around the state are starting to figure out how much would they get. We are really, um, really enthusiastic about this bill. Last thing I want to say is the politics of it. It's not easy, frankly. And what we're doing right now is we want to get it in the budget. The governor's bill contains eight DEC staff people that would administer the bill. We like that. Um, the Hawkeye bill would need about 15 or 16 staff people, according to Commissioner Segos. Uh, so we need this to be done in the context of the budget so we can ensure DEC participation and make sure that the money is flowing from the PRO back to the municipalities. That's our goal. We're rowing in the same direction. We're in a lot of meetings and negotiations every day. Uh, we'll keep you posted. We're hoping that this year is the year. We've already worked so hard on this. There's been hearings, there's been roundtables, there's been meetings. Um, we have good bills now. We have to do merge. There's some differences between the governor's program and the Hawkeye bill. None of them are, you know, issues that can kill it. We can find common ground on those. We've been meeting with all sides. They agree we can find common ground. It's a matter of negotiation, which we're engaging in. So hopefully this is going to work and we'll add a new paradigm really to waste management, waste disposal, waste reduction, and saving you money. Thank you. Any questions? We're gonna go there and then we'll go there. If it passes the session, how long would it take you? Yes, that's a good question. The question was if it passes this session, and I like your optimism, how long will it take to implement? It'll take at least two years to implement. Um, we need to do what's called a needs assessment like study. I'm sorry? I thought it was like four to five. Well, if there's a needs assessment, it could be four to five. We're hoping it wouldn't take four to five. It could be. Uh, there's a needs assessment. The legislation says it's gonna take a year. We believe it'll take about 18 months. It could take more, it could take two years. So we don't know because it hasn't been implemented in America yet. 
the estimate is between two and four years. Depending if we don't move like pre global warming glacial speed. Yes. Oh, and then Karen, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but look like 79% of the provision is one of the provinces. Is that a recycled material or dramatic reduction in waste volume? No, I think that's uh, what the recycled materials. Okay. Yes. The amount of money it's going to save New York City is impressive. Is there any estimate of what percent is going to be taken out of the wind stream? Karen's question is there any estimate of what percent will be taken out of the wind stream? We don't know yet. Anybody yes. Are you working on that? Uh, well, we're going to first work to get the bill passed because without the bill, we don't have to worry about it. So I can't even tell you how much work is going into this bill, but we will we will get those estimates. Yes. Um, you mentioned that Coca Cola was for this. Has it been an industry pushback? Because you're doing money, companies don't like it. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, it's been really interesting this year. I have to say, the industry doesn't, none of them have said we're opposed to this bill. What they're all saying, I've been reading their memos, you know, we keep getting, they keep getting sent to us. And what they're saying is, um, we just want this changed, and we just want that changed. And so, what they're asking for a change is like pushing out the timeline for waste reduction, pushing out the timeline for how much post consumer materials they have to use in their products. So they want more time to comply, but I haven't seen even the American uh, Chemical uh, Council, which normally opposes everything that we are for, even they, uh, I actually met with them two weeks ago. Um, they said, we're not going to oppose the bill. They have concerns about the definition of chemical recycling, which I don't want to go into now because you have a program to get to. Uh, it's been a very controversial and uh, <laughs> detailed discussion. But even they are not opposing the bill. Yes. Uh, Adrian, there's a lot of talk about uh, expanding the uh, Returnable Bottle Act. Yes. Uh, we were talking about wine bottles, and Gatorade, and stuff like that. Is that part of this, or is that a separate track? And what's the status? It's a separate track. We purposely kept it as a separate track. This bill is complicated enough. I mean, you know, we go into how do you recycle plastic bags? What put, I mean, it is really what we call in the weeds bill. So we didn't want to merge these two because that would be too much for the legislature. You got to remember, you know, these are regular people trying to vote on bills and to understand all this. They are not all trash talking like all of us. Um, they are, but in a different way. But um, so I, the bottle bill is on a completely separate track. Like that will not be done uh, in the context of the budget. It's going to have to be a standalone bill. And I'm not sure it's going to make it this year. We'll see. It might. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Great talk. And wonderful job as always. Appreciate it. I was trying to redeem himself on the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got all the work. Next moderator is Mr. KL again. Star of the star of the okay. session. All right now, our next uh, our next speakers are uh, going to speak on the topic of uh, uh, carbon zero and waste energy uh, and what that future will look like. And we're happy to have uh, three very uh, qualified and interesting speakers. Um, unfortunately, you know, because of the weather, um, we had to redo some uh, uh, locations. Uh, we have three, our three speakers are Greg Mumby from the DEC and Mike Van Brunt from Covanta, who is here, and also Dr. Uh, Marco Castaldi from the City College of New York. Uh, Marco was yesterday uh, in an airport trying to get a plane back to LaGuardia, and uh, I don't think he got the plane that he was hoping to get, but he has uh, you know, made quick, done a quick shuffle and he's ready to join us by Zoom, as is Greg. So what I'll do now is uh, I'm going to give you the introductions for these three uh, three folks, and um, I believe Greg is going to start, and then uh, Mike and Marco are going to go ahead, and I, I'll put on uh, the, I'll leave it to them to decide which which goes uh, first because their their uh, their presentations uh, coincide with each other. But Greg Mumby is a, a climate policy analysis in the Office of Climate Change. 
at New York's uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. There, he leads development in the annual statewide greenhouse gas emissions report. And we saw the first of those not long ago. He, is, he also works in policy development, reporting, and rule writing. His previous work includes direct assistance to municipal governments on sustainable initiatives and greenhouse gas mitigation projects. Uh, Greg, are you there? Yes. He is. Are you? I am. There you are. Okay. Good morning. Hold on a second. Let me just, uh, I'm going to, well, okay, you go ahead. And I'll get Mike and Mike Van Brunt and Marco after you're done. Okay. Turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Sorry I couldn't be there today uh, with all of you, but um, I'm also sorry I've had to shovel 16 inches of wet snow. So <laughs> it wasn't great. Um, let me try to share a screen here. All right. So I thought I'd start this conversation off um, by discussing how we're currently looking at emissions from the waste sector in New York State uh, to kind of give us a better framework for understanding how we will get to uh, net zero. Um, to start with, you know, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or uh, the Climate Act, uh, establishes our, our main goals here, which are the uh, 40% reduction from our 1990 baseline by 2030 and an 85% reduction by 2050. Um, those are the mandated goals, uh, but there's also a stated ambition to achieve uh, carbon, you know, net, net, uh, net zero by 2050. So that's a, a separate goal. Uh, it also codifies these clean energy targets, including 100% emission-free electricity by 2040. Uh, and this was passed in 2019. And within that bill, or in the law, um, two, two things that fell to me are the uh, emissions report, which we're required to release annually. Uh, we have so far released two, um, covering 1990 through 2020 is our most recent report. Um, we also established the greenhouse gas emissions limit, which was um, us quantifying the 1990 baseline uh, and then using that to codify the emission reduction targets. So we are releasing uh, the report on an annual basis, and we follow this general um, order of operations of doing early out reach in the winter and spring, um, seeking any input and guidance, which we do take at any time. So if anyone has guidance, please please reach out and have um, any comments or input. Uh, and then usually around uh, April, uh, April to June is when the US annual report is released and other data sets. So we use um, EIA fuel data, which is usually finalized around June. So we need to wait for that before we start those um, analyses. Uh, we'll work through the summer on the development and we'll be releasing in the fall winter. Uh, I think fall is probably optimistic. We've gotten it out at the tail end of December the last two years. So um, that's generally, uh, that's what we've been doing. Hopefully we'll get it out a month or two before that this year. Um, so as I stated, these are the uh, goals, the 40 and 85% reductions. We're looking at all six of the quote unquote Kyoto gases, um, with the main three being CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, we've actually also incorporated a uh, seventh. We are looking at NF3 as well, based on comments. Uh, the inventory covers all sectors of the economy, um, agriculture, land use, all forms of combustion, uh, and waste. Um, and some, some unique things uh, about the accounting for uh, CLCPA is that we are mandated to use a 20-year global warming potential. Um, we are using the, the fifth, the AR5 report, fifth assessment report, um, which actually uh, traditionally most governments and other reporting entities have used AR4, but they are in the process of switching to AR5. EPA is using the 100 year AR5 this year, so we were just ahead of the curve. Um, and other reporting entities will switch in the next year or two. 
Um, now the 20 year global warming potentials has a significant impact for the waste sector, primarily in the landfill and wastewater as the methane uh, global warming potential uh, jumps up a considerable amount in the AR5 report. You're looking at a 28 GWP, you know, it's equivalent to one gram of methane is equivalent to 28 grams of CO2 at a 100-year uh, um, time span. But if you look at the 20-year time span, since the uh, atmospheric lifespan of methane is shorter, it is uh, 84. So uh, a considerable jump um, is the, the same volume of emissions uh, take, appears much larger due to its short-term impact on the, on the climate. Uh, another impact here, another uh, unique thing is that we are looking at the full life cycle of uh, fossil fuels. So all out-of-state emissions are also quantified. Traditionally, governments will just look at uh, the combustion, you know, what's coming out of the tailpipe or what else is within the state. So New York State does have some oil and gas drilling that would have traditionally been accounted for. But we are also now um, including the well, you know, the exploratory, uh, refining, um, et cetera, those and transportation emissions for all fossil fuels. Um, so well, well to wheel, so to speak. Um, a third aspect is the, the gross first net accounting. So in the legislation, the, the law, it, it includes mandated requirements of 85% reduction of emissions by 2050, well, a separately saying that we should be net zero. Um, so the determination is that was the 85% is gross reduction. So when we say are saying the gross goal, that is all emissions um, before lay, uh, sequestration. Um, so any of the uh, carbon sinks from from forests or other uh, land land types, uh, and eventually carbon capture uh, if the, if that comes to fruition. Um, so, due to that, in our gross accounting, uh, biogenic CO two that is uh, CO two emissions from the combustion of uh, plant materials, um, whether that's renewable natural gas, um, you know, landfill gas or otherwise, uh, that is included in the gross goal. But in our net net zero goal, that that gets um, balanced out. So to avoid double counting, uh, we do not count the biogenic CO2 in our net uh, total, as it's assumed that that's being covered for in the land use change section of the inventory. Oh, and I, I should note, uh, I in the 1990 and 2019 graphs, I added colors here those are the waste sector emissions. Uh, so the big orange there would be landfills. I believe the yellow is incineration and the gray in the middle is wastewater. Um, just to give you some reference of the percentage. Um, this is overall uh, waste sector emissions. This is right out of the annual report. Um, and to note the uh, landfill emissions are almost entirely methane, uh, while waste combustion emissions are primarily uh, CO2. And you can see that we're at about 12% of overall state emissions for waste. And uh, another context here is that the 2050 uh, emissions limit, that is that 85% reduction, uh, would be 60 million metric tons. So currently, waste is generating close to 42. So that'd be about two thirds of that budget for the 2050 year, um, just to give it some context. So how we're calculating these emissions is following EPA guidance. Uh, this also follows the IPCC guidance, the, Interna the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Uh, it's a first order decay model, uh, which assumes the input of waste continues uh, to emit primarily methane for uh, 30 years after the disposal. So this is something else to think about is whatever's being put into a landfill this year 
is still going to be on the books for 2050. Um, so that makes it a particularly challenging to mitigate the emissions from, from this sector, uh, especially in the, the time frame that we have. Uh, we're using default uh, factors from EPA. So the waste composition, which gives us the biological content of the waste uh, in the calculations uh, is from EPA data. And uh, then we use New York State reported data on the amount of waste that was either placed in a landfill in New York State or uh, sent through a transfer facility uh, and exported. Um, so that's some things uh, that we can look at more is uh, these factors and how, how maybe we could improve those, but I think I'll get back to that. Um, for the waste combustion emissions, uh, one note here is that based on comments we received, uh, we have moved, oops, there's a typo there, it's IPCC, <laughs> IPCC. Uh, we've recategorized uh, waste combustion from the energy sector to the waste sector uh, after receiving comments that the main purpose of waste combustion is the management of waste. Uh, you know, generating electricity is a, an important revenue stream for combustors, uh, but it's not their primary purpose or intent. So while the EPA and IPCC have waste combustion within the energy category, we thought it was more appropriate to place it in waste um, where the policies that impact waste would also um, interact with uh, waste combustors. Uh, it's a fairly simple, um, uh, fairly simple calculation for our waste combustion emissions, which is the ton of co tons combusted times the emission factor for each of the the three primary gases. Um, and this this combustion data is also, I mean, the tonnage is also sourced from DEC reports, uh, and we're using the EPA emissions factor. Uh, in order to try to get to what amount of that combusted material is plant matter or other biogenic content uh, versus plastics and other types of fossil CO2, um, we, we are using the data sourced from the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program, which is the EPA program for any facility that emits more than 25,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, so all the combustors in New York State fall within this uh, reporting threshold, and they report the amount of CO2, e CO2 coming out of their smokestacks that are, um, how much of that is biogenic. So this, this helps us not only report um, the amount of CO2 that you can attribute to being plant matter, but also um, when we look at that net goal, we would subtract that CO2 um, from the total. Uh, so that also helps with our accounting there. Now, uh, just briefly on some considerations and areas that we're hoping to improve uh, our accounting in the in the future is, you know, as I said before, the waste place this year is still going to be emitting in 2050. Um, and some of this uh, is going to be very hard to address. Um, so it's very likely that that 15 remaining 15% 15 of emissions from the 1990 baseline, the waste sector is going to be a part of that. Uh, you know, I, th I think we all know waste, for instance, wastewater is still going to be generated. I'm not sure, um, you know, kelp seems to work for cows. I don't know if they've done studies on humans yet, but. Um, <laughs> and we also need to improve some of our emission factors. We're using uh, EPA standard uh, factors for waste uh, composition. So we really need to start looking at and getting data on the composition of waste, uh, especially as it's responding to policy. So for instance, diversion of uh, food waste, this is gonna reduce the amount of biological content in the waste ending up in a landfill or in an incinerator. So the more information we can get on this, um, we can help refine our emission factors and have it be a more accurate portrayal of what the emissions out of these facilities are on a given year. Um, and it's worth noting, uh, people also often ask about this, but we, 
when we're talking about the waste sector emissions here, it is just from that facility. It, it's not including the the emissions from uh, the transportation of the waste, whether that's rail for out of state or uh, just just the um, hauling trucks locally. Um, and it's not the entire life cycle of all the products going into these facilities. It is just what is emanating from the facility itself. Um, we also have this waste export uh, issue. And also, I would just say that it, it's much easier to manage our wa waste in state and have control over how it's being handled. If it's being handled in state, once we let it leave the state, we sort of throw up our, you know, we're not sure what's happening with it. We lose data on how it's being handled. Um, and finally, uh, two big categories that we need to look at in the waste sector and start accounting for are anaerobic digesters uh, and composting. Right now, we lack the data um, to get a good hold on either of these type of facilities. And we also have a lot of questions about uh, emission rates um, from some of these anaerobic digesters as we anticipate further development of ADs in the state um, in order to meet our goals. Um, thank you. Uh, and I would just loop back to we're always accepting comments or feedback um, at any time. So if there's anything at all uh, you'd like to flag or, or point us in the direction of, um, we'd appreciate it. And uh, take any questions if anyone has them. Well, Greg and uh, the audience, please. Uh, I think what we might do here is uh, is hold the questions until the other speakers are done. Uh, and then, uh, Greg, you can be around uh, after uh, Marco and uh, Mike can be, uh, uh, can do their talk. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay. Because we'll, that, by that time, you'll have the whole presentation and you can direct a question at any of the speakers. And now, um, I don't know, Mike, if you got the same text that I got from Marco, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Marco Castaldi uh, as our next speaker. And Dr. Castaldi is the director of the Waste Energy Research and Technology Council in the United States, which is an international organization that supports uh, students and postdoctoral researchers. Also, his group is recognized by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as the foremost research group on chemical kinetics of converting wastes to energy. Dr. Castaldi's research will lead to the development of advanced waste energy uh, processes, and in particular, the high efficiency recovery of energy from biomass processes using uh, catalysis. Understanding the fundamental reaction sequences and their associated kinetic parameters is the sure way to provide the requisite capacity, capability to explore and develop new technologies while improving existing ones for converting waste resources into re renewable energy. Currently, Dr. Castaldi has established the Earth Engineering Center at the City College, the City University of New York. The goal of uh, EEC slash CCNY is to bring to bear rigorous engineering solutions that enable responsible use of energy materials for the advancement of society. Through an industry collaborations and research sponsorships, EEC, EEC CCNY develops novel solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems and routinely engages students with industry professionals, enabling a holistic approach to creative, realistic, forward-looking applications. The reach of EEC CCNY is international in scope and with many projects connecting international students and companies with a global presence. So Marco, are you here? Uh, I am, can you hear me okay? Yes, I think we can. So I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Castaldi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And um, hopefully you could see the slide presentation that I have in the you know large format. And if not, maybe somebody could instruct me how to. It looks great, we see it. Okay, okay great. Um, thank you for the introduction, Michael. I, uh, part of that text that I had given you was not to read all that crap that I gave you, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I just didn't know what, what kind of information you wanted to give across. I'll just take a couple of minutes because we do want to have maybe some discussion and questions, um, to, uh, 
basically go through some of the work that we do. This is going to be a combination of work that we're doing at the center that Michael introduced and, and kind of collaboration with colleagues uh, in the United States and around the world. And I want to provide a little bit of perspective and then um, some, some numbers and then some thoughts and, and kind of leave it there. I, I think everybody knows this, right? But, you know, we generally are the problem in the sense that we're generating the garbage, right? These management companies, the different um, options and processes that are available are to manage the garbage that we generate. And, and if we just kind of put that in perspective, right? New York City, where I live, uh, you know, there are bins all over the place, but they just overflow like crazy. Um, and, and for the four to six pounds that we basically dispose of nominally uh, each day for, for each of us, you know, that amounts to kind of throwing away our wardrobe every day or, or let's call it like a, a lamp. And, and if you think about not only how much this is, but also what's included in there uh, starts to kind of, I think, frame how we need to tackle uh, managing the waste in, in different ways. Um, one perspective I, I like to put forward is we're looking here at waste generation rate versus median income. And this is data from a number of different sources, data from work that we've done uh, for individual states, but also World Bank data, EPA data, and so on. And a general trend that you typically see is that as medium income goes up, waste generation goes up. Well, we've kind of delved into the um, data uh, uh, granularly and, and looked at uh, not just averages, but actual uh, waste generation rates uh, as, as median income. And, and you know, we can attach different ideas to this and, and but you know what what comes forward at least from from my perspective is is two things. One is there's a remarkably narrow band spanning from you know five thousand dollars per year all the way to seventy five thousand dollars per year, right? So a little over an order of magnitude. but but then what struck me was we really couldn't find much data. Uh, where uh, uh, across this income spectrum, where it drops below two pounds per person per day. So what this kind of tells me is first, it, there's not really a clear trend. Um, and we've published some work on that to show that uh, it doesn't really track with, uh, with median income. And secondly, I'd, I'd like us to think about that there really is maybe a minimum that's needed to kind of maintain a, 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 you know, an acceptable lifestyle that we all have. We're all familiar with the hierarchy. I don't want to go through it, right? But it's been established in a number of different countries, the EPA and so on. And basically, um, you know, we want to have waste reduction, of course, and then go through the different processes, if you will, to manage the waste, extract energy and materials from it. Uh, materials, importantly, we want to recover. And then, of course, the, you know, what I like to, what we like to look at is that there's different flavors of landfills that are out there and, and they're not all the same. Some are better than others. And, and, and you know, we do think there's going to be a place for landfilling um, in the future, uh, but you know, of inerts or of materials that could be recovered one day. Uh, Germany is actually doing that. Again, I think in this crowd, we don't need to do this, but I like to kind of just put things in perspective. A lot of us talk about CO2, very prevalent on everybody's mind. When you mention things like uh, nuclear waste, very prevalent on everyone's mind. And, and these are the types of things that when at least we, we talk to organizations and groups, you know, what are we gonna do about the CO2 problem? What are we gonna do about the nuclear problem? But the minute we talk to them about garbage, they say, what are you talking about? It just disappears. And we say, well, if you really think about it and put it in perspective, you know, the municipal solid waste problem is kind of right in the middle of these two other waste problems that we deal with. And up here in the left-hand corner, I've got just a couple of numbers, and this is nationally. Um, you could think of the breakdown happening at least in New York City um, and, and New York State as, as being reflective of what's happening nationally. So, you know, nominally about 360 million tons gets disposed of every year. 
So, so what's the impact of those waste management options that we have in the hierarchy in terms of greenhouse gases? Well, if we reuse material, we would uh, save 2.3 tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of material reused. And this is against the baseline of CO2 reduction per ton for each treatment compared to landfilling with gas flaring. So these numbers may uh, not be familiar with you or you may have some similar numbers, um, but these are, are just to kind of provide a little bit of a comparison and ranking. So, so we use 2.3. If we go to recycling, that's about 2.25 tons uh, of CO2 uh, equivalent reduced per ton of MSW. Composting reduces about 0.6 tons. Uh, anaerobic digestion, about half a ton uh, you know, per ton of MSW that's um, uh, anaerobically decomposed. And of course, composting in A&D would have to be of organic fractions, not of glass or metal or plastic. WTE, nominally about a ton per uh, uh, CO2 reduction. And then landfill gas to energy, uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. So, so I just want to point to the kind of the uh, denominator that we have here. It's, it's CO2 equivalent uh, reduced per year ton uh, of MSW waste in place, right? So landfills have a lot of waste in place. So again, it just depends on how you look at this. But this would be a landfill gas to energy project that is recovering that gas and using it beneficially. Uh, they, they do achieve some reduction in landfills. Uh, so effectively, as the hierarchy shows, reuse and recycling are the best in terms of GHG emissions. But what about the actual activity that's occurring today? Well, I'll go through some real examples. This actually is a, uh, an example of um, Nancy Judd, who, who has Recycle Runway. And this is actually a picture in the Atlanta airport. Um, and, and it's around. And, and basically, you know, this movement in fashion is for them to basically reduce their greenhouse gas uh, footprint. And what they're doing is taking materials uh, and making clothes out of it. And, uh, you might think that that is one way of reusing thing. The classic thing that we think of reuse is, you know, you give a couch to a college student or you, you know, you keep using your water bottle or something like that. But there are efforts on a larger scale. Here, uh, this is uh, some person wearing a garbage bag, which I don't know if they've cleaned the garbage bag or not, but this is like the actual garbage bags that, um, and I don't know if they've been used, but they can make a dress out of it. And they've got other things that they can do with that. I guess you can make use wallpaper and so on to make some other dresses. And the Department of Sanitation that we worked with very closely over the years, they, they have a Center for Material Reuse that encourages donations within New York City and, and other tri-state area to, to reuse material. And in one year, that amounts to 43,000 tons being uh, reused. Recycling, uh, you know, that's obviously something everyone's trying to do, um, but, but there definitely is um, some confusion. You know, for example, if you've got plastic bags and you take all those plastic bags and put them in one plastic bag, then you can recycle it. But if you just got plastic bags, apparently if you don't put them in another plastic bag, you can't recycle it. And so this type of confusion, you know, means that the recycling stream, the recycling efforts aren't always followed. And I'll show you a little bit of data very quickly that recycling facilities, they still have a waste stream. So recycle though, amounts to about 90 million tons almost, right? So, so quite, quite a large amount. Composting and anaerobic digestion, just kind of combining it together uh, amounts to about 25 million tons. Um, we can go through the details of this, but you know, of course, you want to re you want to use the material after it's been composted. So so contamination uh, really needs to be looked at for from composting in A and D. Waste energy, I think many of you are familiar with it. I won't go through the details, but that nationally amounts to about thirty million tons. And then landfills, again, there are you know not such modern landfills, but then there are modern landfills that collect the gas, and some of them use them beneficially, and that amounts to 220 million tons. 
So when we go back to that impact, even though, you know, the hierarchy kind of is, is aligned and, and the calculations that you see are aligned with how, how things should be managed. But when you look at what really is managed, it's that recycling and landfilling are dominant, right, by a large amount. And then you've kind of got the anaerobic digestion or composting waste to energy, but reuse, which is the best, is only 43,000 tons. So, you know, order of magnitude below uh, kind of what, what's going on. Again, I don't want to go through some of the details. I do want to be on time. But in terms of recycling, it's not just a confusion. There are technical limits in terms of recycling. And, and this just shows the quality of trade-offs that you might have to look at when looking at the impacts of strength and tensile strength of recycled material and here, we're just looking at two different plastics, polypropylene and, and, and polyethylene. And what happens is, as you mix these two together, you get vastly different properties of the recycled material, depending on the weight ratios of just those two very similar plastics. And so what that means is that, you know, not only the confusion that is uh, uh, out there in the public but also the technical limitations. So, you know, even if we had perfect recycling streams and we're able to mix them properly to get the prod properties of the products that we want, we're still going to be left with, based on, you know, best estimates, a 15% of material that even if it went into the recycle stream could not be recycled. And some of the other data that we have uh, identified uh, recently and published on is that in New York City, unfortunately, only 50% of the material that actually goes into the blue bins by the citizens actually gets recycled. And so it goes even beyond just that confusion and technical uh, aspects. It's also all their markets out there for it. Now, I don't want to go through the details. I'm a little bit over on my time, but in terms of other technologies that might be available for, um, for managing, let's call it very mixed municipal waste. There are things that are called advanced recycling, chemical recycling, gasification, and so on. We could go through all the details behind this, but the two things that I want to point out that I know these slides will be shared is one, the best material to kind of work with on those types of technologies, whether it be combustion or advanced recycling, is the closest proximity to the technology, right? So let, let's not ship it all around and, and I won't go through the data here. But the other thing I want to say is that when we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, using management options for mixed waste um, a lot of things are being done with life cycle assessments. And we just finished a really detailed study of looking at advanced recycling and how it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And again, I won't go through the details, but if we look at the CO2 reduction equivalents over a series of very recent rigorous waste uh, uh, LCAs on, on how to manage different wastes, first, what you see is that you could have ranges that go from nearly 600 CO2, 600% uh, uh, CO2 reduction to 100% increase in CO2, right? So there's really no average that one should speak about when they're talking about these technologies. And the second thing is, if a municipality, a region, an organization is trying to understand what is the best management option that they should use for their waste. The LCAs that are out there in the literature should not be generalized. You need a specific case study to be done. So I'll stop there. I'm a little bit over, I'm sorry, but you could find all this information uh, on our website and I'd be happy to answer any questions during the uh, question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mike Van Brunt. Is Michael coming up? Yep. Uh, Michael Van Brunt is currently the Vice President of, Envir of Environmental and Sustainability at Covanta, where he is responsible for sustainability strategy, uh, reporting and environmental compliance, permitting and monitoring. Michael is a licensed professional engineer with over 20 years of experience in this industry, and he earned a BS and Master's in uh, 
agricultural and biological engineering from Cornell. So I will uh, turn it over to you, Mike. Sorry, yeah. I'm fine with the oh, yeah, I can't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't do yours. <laughs> I thought I had downloaded the one. I did. Yeah, we should find out. That's your screen. There it is. This one right here? Yeah. And I don't know why I didn't download it before. Sorry about that. That's okay. I thought I had it. We're right. ending screens. Share screen. Share. Now we can start your slideshow. Great. Thank you. So I know Greg and Marco had trouble getting here, but I have to say. Driving from New Jersey to Long Island in a nor'easter was basically just all rain. Was the best trip I've ever had. <laughs> no traffic. It was wonderful. Um, what I what I wanted to do is something a little bit different, and I think it builds off nicely of Greg's talk and Marco's talk. Um, was a little bit running through what could CLCPA look like on Long Island, and what are the different scenarios that we might find ourselves in. Um, we all sort of know exactly where waste energy is on Long Island. I won't dwell a lot on this particular slide. Uh, so we have the four facilities. Um, one thing that is particularly important, and it's even more so now with the CLCPA, is the greenhouse gas benefit of waste energy rel relative to landfilling. And that is especially important given that the state has moved to the 20 year TWP for methane. So that's put a very big focus on waste in the state, which I think is a very good focus to have, um, but definitely changes the, the dynamic a little bit. One of the things that we have habitually faced in other parts of the country is getting policymakers to think about waste as it relates to, to climate. And that's usually because in most inventories, they only look at the landfill piece, and that landfill piece is typically two to three percent of an overall inventory. So trying to convince a policymaker that they should worry about more progressive and, and more sustainable waste management is a challenge. They've got issues like transportation, manufacturing, energy that, that tend to be more at the top of mind. Shifting to a methane due to the PO20, which I think you can make a very compelling case is more in line with the challenge we face in terms of addressing the climate, changes that discussion significantly and has done so in New York. And I don't know why all of the formatting has become disastrous. Hang on, let me um... I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I think we're gonna. It'll be better off if it gets downloaded. Oh, okay. Because it's not doing. Yeah. Anything. That's okay. It's. it's uh, I can't even read that. <laughs> it's probably not even worth trying. One second. That's okay. I thought it was something bad. No, no, it's. I always used to tell my boss, you have to download everything I send you. You have to download everything I send you. And of course, I didn't download. So that should okay. be much better. Yeah, it looks better. There yeah, we yeah, go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. You just got in under 30 seconds. <laughs> so I got to stay, stay by the microphone. So where we are is, you know, Predominantly, instead of state state level numbers, these came right out of the uh, scoping plan. We're at about 40% landfilling, 15% combustion, about 19 recycling and composting, and we export about 27% of the waste in the state. So that's where we stand today. Where we need to go, and I think the scoping plan lays this out very clearly, basically we need a dramatic shift in the way waste is managed in the state. And it's not just waste, right? So we probably have all heard the conversations around natural gas and new construction, uh, transportation infrastructure in the state. What the CLCPA requires is a fundamental shift in virtually the entire economy in New York State to achieve those goals. And I have to give it to the state for actually being clear in the scoping plan that this is not without a lot of action that needs to be taken and a pretty significant change in the way that we live our lives. 
So the waste hierarchy still gives us some very useful high level direction in terms of where we need to go. As Marco said, advanced recycling, recycling, when we look at the life cycle analysis, still shows the biggest dividend. Uh, certainly things like anaerobic digestion and composting to the extent that we can manage it well and don't create inadvertent methane problems of their own accord. Those are also outstanding ways of managing and diverting organics from landfilling. Energy recovery will still have a role to play and landfilling will still have a role to play. There will always be inerts left in the system that need to be managed. So looking at the structure of the CLCPA, we already talked about sort of the opportunity of the methane PWP, how that shines a brighter light on the waste management sector. Um, it also does something that is really pretty impressive. It recognizes the impact of waste shipped out of state. And that may not sound like a pretty significant change, but I spent probably 10, 12 years trying to convince Massachusetts to do the same thing. Massachusetts and their inventory, if you ship it out of the state, those emissions don't count. So it's a very convenient way of sort of, you know, effectively putting things off of your books. New York has sort of taken the right step, waste that's out of state uh, lines up counting toward the, toward the accounting. There's a few challenges to biogenic carbon. Question has created, I think, a bit of a challenge in the waste sector because we treat things different in terms of the biogenic suit depending on the path that the CO2 takes to get to the environment. So for example, a compost operation does not count as biogenic CO2, but an anaerobic digester currently does. And so that's one of the challenges that I think the state really needs to take on to make sure that we're not creating um, inadvertent incentives to, to, to process things in a certain way when we're not actually achieving any difference in the climate impact. Um, the other one is a sort of interesting one, and Greg alluded to this too, is when we put waste out in the landfill, that waste is going to be generating methane for a considerable period of time. 30 years is what Greg said when turned with the, the state inventory tool that the EPA developed looks at. It's longer than that. Depending on what your climate is, it can be out 40, 50, 60, you know, even 100 years, depending on how long that biodegradable waste takes to break down in the landfill. Um, what that does for us, I, I kind of would like to refer to a sort of time of action accounting. Ideally, you want your accounting to match up with when we actually make policy changes. So that way, if I'm a town and I implement a new composting program or a new organics diversion program, you want to see the benefit of that as you're implementing the program. And, you know, Greg sort of acknowledged the fact that with landfilling, we have this delayed tail that happens. And so if I put in an organics recycling program, unfortunately, I'm not going to see the complete benefits of that for 20, 30 years, 30, 30 years out. And I think what that can do if you're not paying close attention to that is inadvertently put waste type projects lower on the priority list because you don't get that immediate bang for the buck as you might with some other greenhouse gas reduction program. With that said, the state's production goals for the waste industry are significant. You know, largely looking at, you know, pretty much significant reduction in landfilling uh, by 2050, which makes perfect sense given the role that landfills play in the waste management sector and the methane emissions. The question is, are we really ready for change? When we look at how we have done as a country, we really have stagnated for a good period of time. And there's a lot of you know, systemic reasons for that. We all, all have our opinions in terms of why that is and how do we change that. Waste generation rates have been pretty steady. Recycling, composting rates have been pretty steady. Yet we can't necessarily just rely on past performance as an indicator of future results. You know, so we think about Churchill used to say, no crisis should go wasted as an opportunity. And we know that we've got challenges on Long Island. We know we have the CLCPA, which is calling for and setting uh, targets for dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions across the economy. The challenge is, how do we prepare for that? How do we both ensure that we're meeting the needs of the residents of Long Island at the same time we're pushing for change? And we're trying to do that when we don't know what the population looks like, what the waste generation rates are going to look like, how that waste composition is going to change relative to policy 
uh, levers that we pull, either at the state level or even at the local level. What technology deployment looks like over the next 20, 30 years. Um, and also what the economy looks like. You know, we have seen many times where we see almost like the waste sector as being a predictor of economic activity. Um, we don't think that's probably going to change. It's very much tied into people buying products, throwing away products, and, and unfortunately not managing things at the end of life as, as necessarily as ideal for the environment. So we still have to plan for the future. So now we're going to go into the part of the presentation, which I call the your chance to um, disagree with the numbers that I present. <laughs> So I'm gonna present three scenarios in terms of what are the different ways of looking at the future waste shed in New York State that all meet that 85% reduction in terms of gross emissions, yet approach it from different perspectives. Hopefully, you'll, some of you will look at this and say, that's not aggressive enough, we can do more. Some of you will say, that's never gonna happen, we're never gonna reduce emissions by X percent, we haven't been able to do it before. But I think it at least starts to, starts the discussion around what exactly are we talking about when we start talking about um, the necessary change. So the first scenario, so if we think about what Adrian talked about before in terms of EPR, EPR is a great way of sort of driving source production. No question about it. Um, packaging waste is one of the, I think, big low hanging fruits we have in terms of reducing the amount of waste we generate. So, Take a look at a scenario where we have about a 10% reduction in per capita waste generation. Say we can triple our current recycling, composting, and anaerobic digestion. That equates to about six to eight new anaerobic digestion and compost facilities on the island, and about double the current material recycling rate. You know, a small reduction in waste energy process. And so that gets us to that 85% target. So what we're looking at. Here, the green dotted line going across, that's the 85% reduction relative to the 1990 baseline. So that's the 1990 baseline for Long Island. And then we show sort of both the, the gross side of the ledger, which is the top side of the ledger, and then the net side of the ledger, which is, which is below the line. So on the gross side, we have methane from landfilling. We've got fossil CO2 and biogenic CO2 emissions from waste combustion. We also have biogenic CO2 emissions from anaerobic digestion because those count. Um, and then we also have a small amount of, of N2O emissions, which is another greenhouse gas that can result from the, the combustion process. You can't even actually pick out the N2O one on the big screen. So the black line is sort of what those net emissions are. Now, I've taken a little bit of a liberty with, with this accounting here relative to what the state does in terms of it, its net accounting. As you heard Greg remark that the net accounting takes into account the uh, additional forest growth and different biomass growth in the state. One of the ways that we can help achieve that though is to take pressure off of our forest resources by better using the fiber that we have in the waste system. So we talked about that cardboard, cardboard, getting that cardboard back into useful production helps take burden off of the, the forest resources. The challenge is, is we don't know exactly where that's gonna come from. It could come from China, it could come from Wisconsin, it could come from plantations down south, but the actions that New Yorkers are taking is going to facilitate that, that reduced pressure on the forest resources in the rest of the world. Um, so I've chosen to sort of like, let's account for that when we're talking about the waste management sector, because it is the waste management sector that has the key to unlocking that value. So another scenario. This is maybe the, the less um, personal action-driven scenario, the less recycling-driven scenario. So if we assume that there's no reduction in per capita waste generation, um, we can then double current recycling, composting, and anaerobic digestion to then pull up some of that additional weight from the system. But then we need about 350,000 tons of waste energy capacity additional on Long Island. And then we would need to do carbon capture at about half of those waste energy facilities on island. The last scenario is what if we're more aggressive with regard to per capita waste generation? You know, what if we're able to reduce per capita waste generation by 20%? And what if we're able to achieve about the, the numbers hidden, but it's four times 
increase in current recycling, composting, and enter digestion translates into about nine to 12 new AD and compost facilities and tripling the current material recycling on the island. You know, so think about the amount of capital investment we need to make in new infrastructure, the new siting we have to do for new infrastructure on the island. Um, and then also, you know, this calls for, you know, a, a halving of the waste energy processing capacity. So none of those scenarios is the right one. You know, they all kind of have different problems and challenges with them. But I think one of the things that the CLCPA is going to start forcing us to do is when we think about how are we managing waste on the island? How does that waste management process and planning fit in with the CLCPA targets? You know, and taking into account all of the uncertainty that's there. And you'll know in every single one of those, you know, I didn't put up a zero waste scenario. You know, I also didn't put up a, you know, let's carbon capture everything scenario. Because given the amount of time that we have left, which is not very significant, we're talking about, you know, a 30 year, less than 30 years now. And how long does it take to build new infrastructure anywhere for anything? You know, it's not an easy thing to achieve. So one of the tools that, that we can deploy in that type of a battle is we need to make sure that we have flexibility in the system. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got different choices that we can deploy and not hold ourselves necessarily accountable to one action. So some of the things that we're doing in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from our own footprint, um, on the energy and climate side, we're looking at sort of next generation fuels, both from uh, electricity and hydrogen standpoint. We're also looking at how can we use waste fuels for the cement industry. Cement industry is an extremely carbon intensive industry. Um, that predominantly uses coal and petroleum coal for its energy input, in some cases, natural gas. Waste could be a way of, of reducing some of those emissions. Um, on the metal recovery side, we still have a tremendous amount of metal that's that's left in the in the waste. And Steve Basavi certainly knows this better than most. Um, so we've been getting down to finer metal recovery and also working with the ARPA-E, which is the Advanced Research Program Agency of the DOE on you know, looking at rare earth element recovery. You know, how do we pull out precious metal recovery? How do we pull those out of the space shed? Tell you what, from a climate change perspective, pulling out things like platinum, palladium, gold, you know, makes aluminum recovery look like, you know, small peanuts, but it's really hard to get those, those materials out of the waste shed. Aggregate recycling, you know, we've all heard sort of the discussion around Long Island has a huge need for aggregate. Um, we also have a huge need to reduce the amount of ash that's being produced and possibly recover some of the material out of the ash from the combustion process. Um, and also looking at, you know, diversion and recycling around anaerobic digestion and composting. Um, lastly, we've started to look at carbon capture. And I can't, I, I, I got to give credit to, to the Dean uh, and to Frank for having the patience of working with government grant providers, it is an exhausting process. So I would love to be able to say publicly that we have a funded carbon capture project from a federal agency, but I can't say that quite yet. So hopefully I'll be able to say that pretty soon. And it's a pilot installation of carbon capture at a waste energy facility. It'll be the first carbon capture at waste energy in the United States that hopefully will give us a little bit more insight into how this technology could work what the costs are, and how we might deploy it moving forward. Um, so with that, thanks very much for your time. Okay, questions, folks. Um, anybody, questions for anybody, whether it's uh, Greg, Marco, or Mike, hold, hold back there. Yeah. Um, I work for a nature nonprofit, and so this whole a learning experience for me. I built some background in management and trying to look at some of my friends. We have access to all of these PowerPoints. I think it's a little, it, it's really informational, but it's a little overwhelming to me, and I'd love to get you guys up to.
Yeah, I think we can arrange that, Caitlin, can we? Uh, <laughs> assuming the presenters are comfortable with us sharing the actual PowerPoint files, we can absolutely do that. But we also have this being recorded. Um, so it's going to be available on YouTube in the next few days. Yeah, happy to share it. Yeah, uh, do we have a, a microphone that we're able to hand out to the audience? Do we, we do. We do. Okay. If I can figure out how to turn it on. Okay, now where's those cans again? Right there. I got a loud voice, so <laughs> I got a question for uh, Dr. Castaldi. Um, I was I was very interested in your CO two rates, uh, the reuse, recycling, uh, and waste to energy. Um, there's been a lot of bad press of waste to energy lately, but it looks like the numbers are very close to the other uh, strategies: recycling, reuse. Could you comment a little bit on that? Sure. Um, I guess th what I can say is uh, specifically the values that we have for reuse, which is 2.3 tons per ton of material. That's actually a study that we did specifically with the Department of Sanitation. And we um, had very robust records of the types of material like furniture, clothes, I mean, all the way down to sneakers and shirts um and you know appliances that were reused and then we went uh using the warm model from the epa and and just kind of cross check that with other calculational methods to come up with that average so so that reuse number is um quite uh quite an average because you know reusing a, a sneaker is not going to get you 2.3 uh, tons per CO2 per material, but reusing furniture would. Uh, the recycling numbers, um, you know, again, those numbers pretty much came from the Environmental Research Education Foundation. They did a very strong uh, assessment across the, the country, and our numbers were, were close to that. Um, and then for the rest of them, for the composting, AD, and waste to energy, you know, we've done studies on our own, um, but there is a vast body of literature. And, and, you know, you have companies there like, like Mike uh, Van Brunt's uh, Covanter and, and Real Liberator and, and European companies that, that track that very, very heavily. Um, I think really the numbers from reuse to waste energy are, are good nominal numbers, you know, depending on if you look at specific materials and what kind of calculational method you use, you might get somewhat different numbers, but not terribly different. It's to me the the, the landfill gas uh, or the or the landfill energy number is is the biggest variable because it just depends on what you put the denominator against. If you compare it to fresh waste versus aged waste versus waste in place, and then whether you're using that gas to go into the natural gas pipeline or you're using it for uh, electricity uh, generation or something, you, you'll get vastly different numbers. But but it's not going to uh, go above any of those numbers that are that are above it in the hierarchy. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you just seen that you know, waste energy is it one of the strategies that's in the game. Oh, from, from, from my perspective, all of the strategies should be used. You, not not one of these management scenarios is going to solve the problem. Thank you. Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Gershaw. It's been joining. I have um, two questions, uh, mostly from the Comanta presentation. Um, but some of the slides were talking about uh, maybe diversions, like you were talking about how anaerobic digestics come into play. I'm just curious to know from your perspective, um, how does that affect Covanta's flows? What's that diversion in terms of what are you taking in now that will end up going to anaerobic digesting? And the second question I have is during the slide that showed that on a state wide basis, 15% is combustion, but in the future slides, it increases to 35%. I was just curious if you comment on that as well as the 15% to 35% of the overall state waste going to combustion and then on the, the diversion of the animal. Sure. Uh, I can address for the, the first one on the anarchic digestion. Um, it's a question we get constantly. We've done a lot of work out in California, for example. Um, 
in terms of thinking through what that impact does. They have a very aggressive organic conversion program out in California. That's you know it's 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 slow to start. Um, where we've seen you know mature organic recycling programs in places like outside of Toronto. So we operate a facility outside of Toronto in the Durham York region, Marion County, Oregon. You definitely see an impact on the percentage of biogenic carbon from the combustion process. So every quarter we take a sample, the stack gas is a 24 hour sample. We send that to a lab. They do a split between biogenic and fossil I'm carbon. Sorry, I'm referring to the tons entering the burn plant because you also spoke about waste being exported out of New York. So I'm curious, as you kept referencing anaerobic digesting growing, right. how does that affect the tons of waste that you would burn now? And how does that affect the export numbers? That's what I'm asking. I'm not okay. asking about the CO2. Understood. Thanks for the clarification. So if you looked at those pie charts, and I showed the three different scenarios, the growth of the anaerobic digestion was sort of adjusted with the rest of the waste management. So you saw things like a 10 percent in the first scenario I showed a 10 percent or 15 percent reduction in waste energy throughput. Uh, the last slide I showed sort of a reduction of about you know half in terms of waste energy throughput. So that that becomes part of the overall waste system. So yes, I mean if you if you're exporting roughly 500,000 to 900,000 tons off the island today for landfilling and you can grow your recycling, composting, and anaerobic digestion. More than that, you know, we can keep waste generation rates the same or bring them lower. Absolutely, you will have less of a need for waste energy capacity. But again, one of the things that we've really stressed out in California and other other places have sort of taken this approach, you, you need to be really, make sure that you're adjusting for what happens in practice. One of the things that happened in California is that they made assumptions with regard to how the waste shed would change. And then the waste shed didn't change because we didn't implement the policy as quickly as we thought we were going to. So that's just sort of the caution that we ask. We actually, as we're sort of advancing policies, EPR, anaerobic digestion, we need to keep a very careful watch on what the impact of those policies is having in real time so that we can adjust plans as appropriate. And the second part of overall on state basis of going 35 percent incineration compared to 15 percent where's that coming from right so all those charts that i showed were just for the long island example so how is coke Fanta going to increase its consumption by 20 percent from 15 to 35 well because your your waste shed actually becomes smaller you know so in the two two examples that i showed scenario one and scenario three it shows a a per capita waste reduction on Long Island. So that's why you see as a percent share of the waste remaining, you see that growth. Thank you for the clarification. Sure, thanks for the question. Anybody else? Let me bring the mic over. It's just easier to hear on the recording. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, the presentation of this discussion. Um, what I do find missing here is this is a very corporatist view of waste. Uh, we don't talk about the impact on human life. And uh, with Covanta, we have four Covanta facilities on Long Island alone um, that are impacting people's lives with the uh, toxic fly ash and all of that that is going into our, our, um, our air. So my question is, where is the community perspective in this discussion? And, you know, we are having it here at Stony Brook, which, you know, a facility of higher learning, I get that. But uh, there are places where this waste crisis is impacting life and death. And I feel like this is where that conversation needs to be taking place and that those voices need to be uplifted. Um, and then specifically to Kovanta, um, my question is, especially with the Babylon facility, we um, we heard that there was some uh, possibility that the site might close, and community is really pushing for closure of these sites because um, in the Babylon facility, especially, that's right next to Wine Dance. Wine Dance has the highest admin rate in Suffolk County, 
So um, I want to know when are we going to talk about closing some of these toxic facilities and what's the plan for a regional plan that reduces our waste to zero waste so that we don't need all of this infrastructure like the Brookhaven landfill that is closing um, but no point that has a low life expectancy. We have Provanta Hempstead uh, within a community that is by and large Black, Indigenous, Black, Next community. Uh, we're being overburdened by this, these facilities, and we don't even have a seat here at this table. Uh, Mike, uh, can you just tell us if families have been very close or not? I, no, I, we, we don't currently have any plans to, to, to close that one facility. Um, I think your, your points are well stated and well made. Uh, I certainly appreciate your comment. You know, I think just touch on a couple of things is, you know, the facilities, um, you know, operate well below their permit limits. Uh, when we've looked at sort of what the actual impacts are on the local air shed, there are impacts. You know, I don't think it's appropriate to, to assume that there's not. Uh, one of the things when I sort of show the waste hierarchy discussion, that I always stress with people is what Europe does is they draw a very distinct bright line between waste avoidance and everything else. And everything else on that waste hierarchy has some form of an impact. And what our jobs are as waste practitioner, practitioners are to reduce those impacts to the extent that we possibly can. Um, there is no perfect solution. You know, we, uh, we have goals and, and endeavor to sort of operate our facilities as well as we possibly can. Um, but it does have impacts. However, those impacts are relatively minor compared to all of the other impacts, unfortunately, we face in our local communities. And, you know, I'm not speaking about a specific facility, but you're right to point out that waste historically has impacted disadvantaged communities more. You know, that's a fact. Um, what we do now is to sort of, A, operate facilities as well as we can, B, look at what the regional needs are, as you pointed out, as part of so those different scenarios to planning that we talked about. But ultimately, we still have to meet the needs of the island in terms of waste generation. And hopefully things like what Adrian talked about with extended producer responsibility help reduce the amount of waste that we generate. Because that's the only thing that we can do with waste that doesn't have an impact. Thank you, Mike. Um, I guess I can also add that, uh, you know, our uh, presentation here today is uh, not targeted to specific facilities, and uh, you, you raise a number of big issues that, that may need a, another day. It could take another day to really do justice to our our panel here. Um, is not you know they're here to speak about what they know. Um, we're not you know we're looking in a general sense on the policy and. Uh, you know, I don't know that we can adequately answer the questions that you uh, pose, even though they deserve an answer. Um, Michael, could I could I comment? Michael, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I'd just like to make just a very brief comment. I, I I don't know who the who the person is that made the comment, but just really kind of at the high level. It's great that there are people uh, being very concerned about the garbage that we generate because you know we're the ones making the garbage. However, I would encourage uh, the person who made the comment to really delve into the vast body of literature that exists on the impacts of the different management options. We recently finished a one and a half year study looking at the different impacts of the management options um, from scientifically peer reviewed articles around the world, from you know, Asia to Africa to the EU to, to the US and South America. And there is a general um, data set that's out there that demonstrates that following the waste hierarchy is the way to manage the garbage that we generate in the most sustainable with lowest environmental impact that there is. 
Thank you, Marco. Um, I think we've got now, uh, we're really running out on uh, time. I mean, we've got a, a great schedule now. So I think let's take five and we'll be back with food waste. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you. My name is Bill Flower. I'm pleased to be moderating our next session, uh, which is going to focus on good large scale food waste composting to become a reality here on Long Island. And I, I, I think there's two important slides to take a look at. The first is these are the generators of waste, uh, of food waste. And, and these are all slides right off of the DEC website. So if you take a look at this, these are all, it's a dot map of all of the large scale food waste generators in the greater New York area, but focus on New York. And of course, what did we talk about in the first sessions? How important infrastructure was to manage this different type of waste stream. So yeah, we got all these generators focused on producing waste. Now let's take a look at that same website, New York State DEC, and this is the infrastructure to manage that waste. That is the problem, is that there's a disconnect between the amount of generators that we have and the number of facilities. We obviously need, need more. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Sally Rowland with us. Uh, Sally is gonna be our first speaker. She's gonna be joining us remotely. And then uh, we have my good friend, Charles Vigliotti, uh, who is the uh, head of American Organic Energy, along with Long Island Compost, him and his brother Arnold, and you will not find two brothers who are closer than, than the, the two of them. Uh, just great minds, great thought leaders, and are gonna share with us an update on the uh, digester plant, which is so critical to the future of food, uh, food waste on Long Island. And then we have my good friend, Mark Havner. Uh, Mark works as a organizer, civil advocate, uh, co-convener and thought leader, mostly on the East End. Uh, but, but Mark is uh, certainly gonna be providing a little bit additional insight in terms of what's going on on the local level and what we need to, to do to increase the amount of food waste and organic management across Long Island. Uh, so with that, we're gonna uh, switch over to Sally. And uh, it will just take a second. Sally Rowland uh, it, it runs the Organics Reduction and Recycling Program for the New York State uh, DEC. So with that, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go remote. Thanks, Will. Uh, thanks everybody for giving us the opportunity. Uh, again, we're a little snowbound here in Albany, but uh, it won't last long because it's it's spring almost. So. But I'm happy to join you today. We're going to talk about food scraps. Going to focus a little bit more directly. We're trying to pull up our presentation. Somebody else is sharing, it says. So I just stopped our sharing. So you should be able uh, to. Great. Yeah, as Will said, I'm out of Albany. We do our section has a luxury, if you will, that we focus very directly on organics. We're not just solid waste in general, as our regional staff kind of have to juggle lots of different issues in solid waste and materials management. But the section I work with, we do organics directly. What I'm gonna focus on today is looking at food scraps or food waste on Long Island and what's going on, just kind of a general overview. First, I wanna give you a snapshot. We've already touched on this a little, but kind of more specific numbers for Long Island for municipal solid waste in general, and then we'll kind of narrow down to food scraps. So if we look at the population of Long Island, this is in 2018, was about 2.8 million, about 945,000 households. So about 2.8 people per household on average. The disposal rate for municipal solid waste, this doesn't include construction debris, ash, obviously there's other waste streams, but if we're just looking at trash, uh, the stuff that goes to the curb, then on Long Island, it's 4.5 pounds per person per day. That's a little higher than the rest of New York State. The rest of New York State's about 4.09 pounds per person. 
a lot of it uh, is actually yard waste. Long Island is very proficient at producing and collecting yard waste. Some other places in the state, not as much, or it may not be collected. The, so the total waste generated on Long Island is about 2.9 million tons per year. And of that, about 2.3 million tons is disposed and 574,000 is recycled. So your recycling rate is about 19.8%. It's been mentioned earlier, it's been stagnant for a number of years. It's similar elsewhere in the state, similar rate to other places in New York, but that yard waste component tends to be more, again, on Long Island than we see elsewhere in the state. From uh, planning units, this just gives you an idea of, as you all know, we have a program in the state of New York for planning units for solid waste. And it's up to the locality. In most places upstate, it's counties. And uh, obviously in Long Island, it tends to be towns. So not always. In some places on the island, it's broken into smaller units. And this also shows what the landfills and combustors where they're located on the island. Is I'm sure most of you know, the, long, the landfills on Long Island are not MSW landfills. They can't take unprocessed waste. So these landfills remaining on Long Island, either ash or other limited materials. Uh, as mentioned too, we, you do have a number of combustors in this, in the, on Long Island. And we'll talk about those in just a second. Let's take a look at the overall picture of where waste is going right now, how you manage your waste on Long Island. Actually, 68% is managed on the island itself, all through combustion. The remaining material is either sent about 20% to landfills in Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and about 11% comes upstate to landfilling in primarily out in the Rochester area, DEC Region 8, and a small amount to the Capital District. Again, those are going to landfills. There is some material that actually comes onto Long Island from New York City and small amounts from out of state, but it either is combusted on Long Island or just simply comes out and go, comes in Long Island and turns around and drives back out. It's a transfer operation. As I mentioned, and then we've talked you know, briefly about, there are four combustors on Long Island. There's 10 statewide in New York State. They're similar in some ways, but as this shows, they're different in some ways. Size-wise or how much their throughput is varies significantly. One in Hempstead, obviously, being the largest of the four. So just that's an overall picture. Now we'll talk more specifically to food scraps and what our opportunities are. If we look at the waste stream, we about 18%, a big slice, if you will, of the, the pie here is food scraps. If we include yard trimmings, we're up to 25%. We include some of the paper that's not readily recyclable or even higher. So when we talk about organics recycling in general, we're talking about large amounts of the waste stream. It's not a small component we're going after here to make a difference. So if we look at that amount, the amount is about 17.6, call it 18% of the municipal solid waste stream in suburban areas like Long Island is food scraps. So that means there's about 500,000 tons per year generated. Of course, that's in multiple areas. That is from residents, that's from commercial side, that's from industrial side, that's from even farms. One thing to remember here is there's lots of sectors when it comes to food scraps. Studies have shown homeowners are one of the biggest sectors. We always think of grocery stores and restaurants as generators, and they certainly are. But our, our in our own home is a huge part of this generation point. So we have to look across all those potential sources. We got a ways to go in recycling. Back in 2018, only about 1%, give or take, of the food scraps generated in Long Island was recycled. Not that much different than elsewhere, or two, 3% maybe statewide. So Will showed a little bit about, showed a little map of this too. What facilities do you have on Long Island? This 
map does include yard waste as well as food scraps because some of the yard waste ones do take some food scraps. Some dots here, but not a lot of capacity. You know, it's not a lot. Certainly it's better than it was 10 years ago, but it's, it's not showing a lot of capacity right now on Long Island for recycling. I wanna to just touch base on what we work on a lot right at this moment is the implementation of the New York State Food Donation and Food Scraps Recycling Law. It's a New York State law that took effect January 1st of 2022 to try to address food scraps. The interesting part about our law compared to some other states and localities that have similar ones is there's a big focus on food donation as well as recycling and we're very, dedicated to try to push the donation as a, certainly a, the first place to go before food scraps recycling, if it's wholesome food. What does the law say? Basically, if you generate as a business more than two tons of food scraps per week, you have to donate edible food to the maximum extent practical. And you have to recycle what's left over if there's a facility within 25 miles. Of course, that's the catch. You have to have a viable recycler within 25 miles. A word now about organics recycling. There's lots of different ways. We've already heard about composting, anaerobic digestion. There is use for animal feed, either directly or after processing. There's some look at fermentation. So we are pretty open on what's considered organics recycling, as long as you're making a soil product or an animal feed or something like that. There's even obviously upcycling to take food and make it food, what to traditionally was a food waste, but make it into other products for human consumption. So we really have to look at the whole gamut of what's out there. There are some, and our website certainly has information and we'll provide you links on who's required to comply. There are some exceptions to law. New York City being a big one, but they have their own local laws. Why? If they abandon their law, then they come under the state law. Some others, adult care facilities and nursing homes. But obviously we still reach out to them and provide them information on how to go about doing it if they're interested. We, under the law, DEC has to come up with a list of large generators or designated food scraps generators. Again, they're on our website. You're welcome to go take a look. There's about 12, 1300 totally in the state, again, excluding New York City. So we update that list every year. We do have waiver provisions and we get questions about, oh, we are just, you know, are you wavering or letting everybody out of the compliance of the law? And the answer is no. We've only issued 25 waivers, uh, 28 altogether for 1300 and some. So people are coming into compliance. People are you know, starting to understand what the law means to them. And we're not getting a lot of pushback in terms of compliance or trying to wait. Of course, the biggest issue is cost in terms of going to a new alternative that may be significantly costly. So if we look, take a look at that overall list, as I mentioned, we have about 1300 total but if we look at Long Island specifically, these are the what we call sectors or different categories of food scraps generators. Again, that's under the law. So this is not residential. This is up to commercial type to be at two tons per week or more. So we'll see it's what we see typically grocery stores are the biggest ones. Restaurants, again, you have to be a fairly big size chain restaurant to be on this list. Super centers, your Walmarts, that kind of stuff on the list. And obviously the law says everyone who is this large generator must donate. That's why the numbers are all the same in that column. Everyone who's a large generator must also be donating. But again, those that are only within 25 miles have to recycle of a viable facility. So if we look at the overall numbers, we have 250 generators under the law, 250 have to donate, but only 73 right now have to recycle, about 29%. So what does that mean? means we need more recycling facilities. I don't want to, again, don't want to go on without reminding us all, it's not just about recycling, it's about waste reduction, it's about food donation. Those all have a critical role as well. It's not just about recycling, but recycling is always going to be needed to deal with material. 
Okay, how much do they generate? If we try to take a look at, okay, how much is a law gonna drive the recycling or food donation specifically to Long Island? This is again, this is a picture, as Will mentioned, you can pull this off our website or off uh, Pollution Prevention Institute, which works with us, has lists all the generators are subject to the New York state law, or even beyond, you can even get some smaller generators from this map. So there's lots of generators, not surprisingly, but you can we can show you where they're all at and estimates of how much they generate. So if we look at that data approximately, we have about 42,000 tons that are generated um, from large generators. So the Long Island food scraps generation in total is 512. So 42,000 are picked up by the law, if you will, 42,000 tons per year out of about 500,000. So the law really is only picking up about 10%, better than nothing by long shot, but it's not going to be the only thing that drives. It has to be something beyond the law unless the law is amended to include more generators. So we're gonna need new, more, for infrastructure for donation, more work on waste reduction, and more work on organics recycling. We get questions about enforcement of the law. We do enforcement to regional offices, inspections of grocery stores that's just begun in this last year. So we will be performing spot inspections. We've already begun doing that. Part of it is education. Businesses aren't even aware necessarily, even though we've notified them many times that they have to comply with the law, it's still going to be an education, but clearly a more driven enforcement as well. We do have partnerships or contracts that DEC works with. Feeding New York State has been a great partner on the donation side. We have a contract with the Center for Ecotechnology. They work with many New England states on providing technical assistance on food scraps reduction. So these are all resources, free resources, because we're contracting with them to help to develop these systems. Pollution Prevention Institute out of Rochester helps us with research uh, application. Then we have more peer research being done at Cornell and SUNY ESF in Syracuse. As I mentioned, Feeding New York State has been a great resource for us. I know they've already spent time on Long Island. Just under this contract, they've already secured more than 2 million new pounds of donations under our program with them and they're doing great stuff. They go store to store, very motivated bunch. So, and they have phone numbers and other ways to help reach out to. And we're providing funding for them too, to distribute to the food banks, to buy equipment and staff to, to obviously once you line up the food, somebody has got to pick it up and get it to where it should, to those that need it. As I mentioned, CET, we provide through them great assist, free assistance on how you go about donating, how you or how you go about recycling if you're a business, all, and other kinds of assistance. So they have a great website and direct assistance available. And Pollution Prevention Institute, they're the ones that develop the maps, help us with the list, do a lot of other research-oriented stuff. We also, this is a program through P2I, DEC can fund municipalities and we can fund nonprofits. We cannot fund businesses, but Empire State Development has a program through P2I to do funding on the private side, so the generous, and we can provide you more information on that. As I said, DEC, we do funding. We've been very fortunate to have $2 million a year specific to food scraps for the last few years. So we're looking to add more funding in 2023. We've been able to fund every municipality that's come in so far. And we're hoping with 2023 money to continue that. And we're fairly quick in the turnaround. Current grants for municipalities is a 75% state share. So it's a significant uh, boost in this round. We also fund emergency food relief organizations, food banks, Again, trying to help on that side to make sure they have the infrastructure and staff to move material. And at last, we do a lot of outreach and education. We have a lot of publications and we certainly, one of the best things you can do is we have a listserv. So whenever we have some new publication or anything, you'll get an announcement of what's going on. So if you haven't done so, please sign up to our listserv. Thank you. Thank you.
So Sally is one of those people that is just an incredible resource, and and uh, she she is also amazingly uh, accessible. Uh, I see Dave Vitale here, and and Sayed, other people that at the DEC when you, when you you think the DEC is this big monolith or or, or a bureaucracy, the reality is. Uh, we're very fortunate to have some people like Sally, like David, like Syed, who are incredibly accessible. Uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, talk, uh, you heard Sally mention and talk about the generators of waste. Obviously, the facilities are a critical part of that. So Charles Bigliotti is going to come up and talk about uh, one of the most exciting projects uh, that, that are coming to ma help manage solid waste here on Long Island, and that is the uh, anaerobic digester that's going to that is under construction right here in in Yapeng, and uh, and then following that we're going to go to Mark Hadner. So uh, with that, Charles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Will. When Will first let's get your slide up. Was that Will first reached out to me and uh, honored me by asking me to participate uh, in this forum? Um, and he told me the title: "Will large-scale food waste composting become a reality?" And I was tempted to make my presentation short. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I thought you might be interested in a little bit more detail to this. But as I thought about uh, my presentation, I found myself focusing, because we do this every day, on all of the problems, the difficulties, the hurdles, that we have had to overcome on myriad uh, in myriad areas, uh, you know, many of which you can probably imagine, and stuff you cannot possibly imagine. <laughs> but I found myself going down a rabbit hole where I was feeling sorry for myself <laughs> um, and losing sight of what we're focused on doing right now. And by the way, a lot of people ask me, we are in construction right now. You know, we are currently uh, excavating for a foundation. Uh, shortly, and we will be fully operational third quarter next year. But, yes, some of you probably heard a lot of this, but this facility will take 210,000 tons a year of food waste, fats, oil, greases, removing it from the waste stream. We will create through this facility 500,000 MMVGU of non fossil fuel generated compressed natural gas. And I lost track of how many thousands of homes this will eat. It will go into the National Grid Pipeline right at our facility and be used by the uh, community of Brookhaven. Um, and uh, it's a good thing relieving um, the region from having to ex import natural gas. It will also produce 45,000 tons a year of organic compost. It will produce 5,000 gallons per week of organic liquid fertilizer. And it will, by the way, remove 85,000 tons per year of greenhouse gases. It's a substantial facility. It will be one of the largest, one of the three or four largest in the world, I believe. Now come the issues. But even before that, you don't take on a facility, you don't get into the position of actually constructing this without a lot of support from a lot of people. And one thing we learned early on in the waste business and a lot of the waste professionals 
in this uh, room will understand this. First thing you got to do is go talk to your community. Without that community support, it's just a long, hard slog, no matter how good or worthwhile your project. So I encourage everyone to, to do that. And I'm so thankful to the local Yapang community for taking the time and being constructive and uh, helping us come to this point. And then two other critical, critical areas of support. First, from the DEC. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, Peter Scully, who was here uh, when uh, Peter was the uh, regional director of uh, DEC in the state. And then absolutely critical was the support of our local town of Brookhaven under the leadership of uh, Supervisor Ed Romain, um, recognizing the town's responsibility in helping to manage the waste in the town of Brookhaven. And, and I commend the town and Supervisor Romain for being at the very forefront of uh, sound environmental thinking and solid waste. Without their support, the support of many others, this would not be possible. But it's not easy. God, it is not easy. There are so many hurdles to this. And uh, Sally will certainly tell you, and, uh, you know, common knowledge, anaerobic digestion is not new. And it is not even new to this country. What is developing is anaerobic digestion or food waste. There are hundreds of anaerobic digesters in this country handling animal foods. And they do a great job. They're environmentally uh, very, very important, but they are so easy. They have a homogeneous infeed. <laughs> The manure looks the same every <laughs> single day, every hour of the day. There is very little pre-processing associated with this. It produces gas, and the byproducts of that gas are easily disposed of. You create a liquid digestate, and this liquid digestate has some solids in it, organic solids. It has uh, it's all water and it's got a lot of high nutrients, a lot of high nitrogen in it. And animal digesters are located adjacent to animals, which are usually on large agricultural pieces of property where they grow the feed for the animal. And they fertilize the fields with the digestate. Great. Works fabulous over there. Can't do it on Long Island. Can't do it on Long Island for a bunch of reasons. Number one, we do not have a homogeneous infeed. The food waste looks different. Not just every day, every hour, every load, every generator. It will be different. There will be more sugars, more carbohydrates, more proteins, more fats, different levels of contamination. People will throw it out in plastic bags. There will be dent cans that the supermarket can't, uh, can't recycle. There will be cases of spent milk that uh, will come in in the case. So first thing, we have a tremendous amount of pre-processing that we're building into this to remove the plastic bags, to purge the um, digestible food waste from its containers, to separate those waste streams, to recycle what we can. We will take a, a dented can of tuna. I used to have this, my visual aid. A dented can of tuna 
that would not be able to be recycled. We'll take the dented can in, we'll purge the tuna out of the can, we'll get gas out of the tuna, we'll recycle the can. We'll bring it right up the street to, uh, you know, Gershaw Recycling. <laughs> After that, we're going to take all this food waste, we're going to create a slurry. The food doesn't go in as a solid. You recycle a whole bunch of water in this, and you create a, a pumpable slurry. And it's going to go into these giant tanks where the food waste, the organics, are going to break down. Now, we had through a couple of our speakers talking about how um, landfills produce gas, and they produce gas for decades after the um, waste is buried. Well, that gas is the organics breaking down. And organics break down. No matter what you do to it, no matter where you put it, it's going to break down. And it's going to break down in our, in our tanks. The difference between a compost operation or a uh, landfill is the methane is going to look the state. The methane is going to be captured, cleaned, you know, you remove any moisture from it, et cetera. And it's going to go first to produce the electricity necessary to handle the parasitic needs of the plant. After that, it's going to go into the national grid pipeline. Great. But then you have this digesting that in agricultural communities becomes a benefit, um, you know, because they can fertilize their fields with it, grow the uh, feed to feed the cows. But over here, on Long Island, in this congested area, we don't have that. And probably our friends in the environmental community might have issues with just spreading out a whole bunch of high nitrogen uh, liquid uh, on, uh, on land. So what do you do with this uh, digesting? Well, you pull it back into our processing facility. And the first thing you do is you mechanically remove the solids, centrifuges. And as I said, you're gonna have 45,000 tons of this, um, the valuable, Product handled responsibly. Long Island Compost prides itself on handling organics responsibly. But then you have all this water with this super high nitrogen. That's a whole big problem. So we're going to pull the nitrogen out. We're going to pull, you know, 90% of all the nutrients out. Um, it's advanced technology. It exists in this country. Other facilities are using this. Uh, this technology that we're going to be producing probably in the area of 250,000 gallons a year. It's a valuable commodity when used properly in the agricultural community. And then you have the water, pretty clean water at that point. But we're not just disposing of it. Through a partnership with Suffolk County, we've also been tremendously successful. We'll be bringing that water to the Burbage Point um, uh, wastewater treatment plant, and it's clean water at that point. Then it will go through their processes. Complicated. Further complicated on Long Island because of our congestion. One of the advantages of a facility like this on Long Island is got a lot of people. We all eat all day. Every day, we produce food waste. Great. You know, we've got a lot of food waste that we can handle. But there are neighbors on Long Island. And you have to be conscious every day, all day, of being a good neighbor. And when you have a facility such as this, it's critical that you engineer this facility to the absolute highest standards so that this facility has zero impact outside of its property line. And we have 
taken it upon ourselves. It's our responsibility to ensure that we not only use the best available technology, but we put the belt on, we put the suspenders on, we put the vest on. We have multiple layers of ensuring that our neighbors don't uh, suffer any negative uh, impacts you know, because of the operation of this facility. That's not how you build a sustainable business. Um, the problems, what I found as I was organizing my thoughts for this, when you talk about all the stuff we're going to do and all the benefits of it, those problems that seem so insurmountable, one after another after another, all of a sudden, it don't matter. We're just going to do this. Anyway, hopeful that uh, you know you stay tuned. That uh, third quarter of next year, taking in place to making gas. And next up, I want to introduce Mark Hadner. As I said earlier, if you're on the East End, you probably know Mark, but he's going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the efforts that, that he's been working on in terms of uh, some small scale composting and answer the question can we do it on a larger scale? Oh, thanks. <laughs> about game. I don't have pockets. So. <laughs> I think I know you well. <laughs> uh, first thing I want to do is take a picture of everybody. My, my wife thinks I'm famous, but she doesn't believe it. She doesn't believe more that I got up at 4.30 to do this. So uh, I have to prove out on that. Thank you. Thank you, Will, for the honor to speak today to the entire Liblet team and to uh, Stony Brook, uh, our hosts. And thanks for your attendance and your attention today. I'm here on behalf of a number of uh, partners. And I'm, I'm, if you get anything out of what I, I have to say in the next nine and a half minutes. Uh, there are three themes, and that's collaboration, um, behavior change, and new industries for Long Island. Um, I, I, I'm just a volunteer, so what I do is I just get people to do things. I found out there's a, a job title for this, and I probably charge Will a lot of money uh, for creating uh, and designing behavior change programs, but that's what we do. Um, as to the question of whether food Push the button, uh, that the right button. I can handle this. This is a tech for 30 years. Um, the question of whether food waste and compost will become a reality. Um, I, I, Charlie sits over there. I'm going to sit over here. He said, yes, I'm just going to say no. The simple answer is no, because we keep insisting on calling it waste. Public perception is that food waste is gross and should be sent away. But if we change the language and the framing to honor our food as a resource, from the time we get it to the time we don't have it anymore, we will change the answer to yes. Collectively, to everyone in this room and beyond, I would pose the idea that if we create a vision based on a circular economy, that we can turn our solid waste management crisis into a recoverable resources opportunity. What can be managed, managed oh, sorry, what can be measured can be managed. With all the work I've done in the human behavior side of this for a number of years, I found if we break down solid waste into sections based on material, that our job's going to be a lot easier. So if it's food or clothing or sneakers, we talked about all this today. By making a mission, which drives to the vision, of diverting, recovering, and reusing 100% of our region's food scraps by 2030, we will create measurable goals to achieve the mission. We can do the same thing for construction and demolition, Storm debris and the rest of the materials on our desk right now. And some of you are mentally rolling your eyes saying 100% is never going to happen. But if you have a football team and you put the goalpost at the 50-yard line, that's what you're going to get. We have to push to 100% to get to 90 or 80 or 70 by the time frame that we're looking at. Has to be done. Back to framing and language. I hear myself telling civic groups that we're closing our landfills in 24. And this is what they see over on the left. But everybody here, uh, what we know is that the true picture is on the right. I also hear from regular people that there's one phrase that strikes fear into the hearts 
of, of our citizenry. It's we are the government and we're here to help. Um, so that I thought that was appropriate. What I've heard from our government uh, is that we don't need more regulations. And working from the behavior side at the very, very, very small level of residences, because that's mostly where our waste is, it was mentioned before, uh, it's about 70, 30. So 70% of our food scraps come from residences, right? We got 3 million people. So we're gonna work on those numbers in a minute. And I've found that working with people is kind of like this, right? So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And without a direction or solid working plan, and successful pilot programs uh, behind them, this is the result. Not a lot of facts and figures here, folks. Uh, there are. Uh, the chart on the right is from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We rely on them heavily. Uh, taking the lead on zero waste is our group. Karen, Will, uh, Kenny, uh, thank you. Yes, and Nancy Martin, thank you. Michael, oh, Michael too. I thought you were just the camera guy, all right. Um, fully committed to the concept that we need to create a local and regional self-reliance. We've done it before, people. We had Grumman here. We've had all sorts of things here. It's not meant to be isolationist or to compound any balkanization that we're suffering from right now. Quite the reverse. We're here to an extend an offer to bring a team of people together. And they're in this room. I don't have to look any further than the talent in this room. To the table, they're drawing on our talents as a wide range of stakeholders, as is necessary to reach the mission of zero waste and a region-wide circular economy. We see this as a new breath of life for Long Islanders who may not have recovered from the erosion of small industry over the last four decades. Also very much at just simply stopping any action for creation of yet another study, another three-wing binder collecting dust on a shelf. We're talking about implementing a living, breathing, dynamic plan of a series of programs which come organically, pardon the pun, from all of our citizens. This is our time frame, um, and that's if you don't sleep, right? which I don't. I'm already losing sleep over the urgency of, of this, and I hope you are too. Stress and worry are not gonna get us where we need to go. Fear is the enemy of creativity. We see it when we worry about job security or insurance claims or costs of garbage disposal going through the roof. I'm gonna read this. Decision makers commonly mistake complex systems for simply complicated ones and look for solutions without realizing that learning to dance with a complex system is very different from solving the problems that arise from it. I would suggest then that we start not by creating markets, but creating value first. From that come products from a wide range of people, small single owner, decentralized cooperative groups of people who then form companies from which the markets then become created. And we have millions of tons of resources at our disposal. We all know what a microscope is, how a telescope works. We see pictures of electrons now. We see clusters of galaxies from deep time. What we need now is a macroscope which sees the infinitely complex because when people show up, everything goes from complicated to complex. These are real numbers. We have uh, 3 million about uh, people in the two counties, a half a pound per person per day of solid food uh, or food scraps. That many pounds divided by 750 tons a day. If you add industrial, commercial, institutional, and governance, it's another 30%. And the reason that we found this is like kind of, I don't know, common sense, I guess, but restaurants don't lose a lot of food because they're using every single thing that they have. We at home do not. So food reduction, waste reduction is going to be one of the prime uh, focus uh, points for our work this year, as well as matching grocery stores and the seven large generators of overhead to the food banks. We found out recently that the food banks are buying food in order to feed their population. There's, there's something, there's a disconnect there. So I want to um, keep moving here. I have to thank, thank Sally Rowland and her team for making the Climate Smart Communities Program available to us as a guideline for our programs. When we looked in Riverhead at this thing in 2019, this is what we saw. Turning our region into a single unit looked like this, but we started doing pilot programs this is what we started to see. A trip to Albany for the full day seminar at the DEC, we created a 
our first food scraps to compost program on the way home back to Long Island. And this is what we've done since 2019. Um, 1,100 pounds in 30 days, 30 families. And what we did find that they were putting it all into green buckets. We were bringing it to the farm and weighing them and all this. This is how we know that, that the half a pound per person per day is correct. Um, interesting things happened that, that a large family wasted less per person than a small family of one or two because you buy too much. We're back into the waste reduction and you know, consumption. Um, we're integrating the climate smart communities into the town of Riverhead solid waste management plan right now. We had a mini summit last month. We're going to 200 families, and this is how the uh, civics are helping us get involved with that. Again, community engagement is a big thing. Uh, we've got we just got a twenty thousand dollar grant from P2I, uh, Beth Attendi from Long Island Organics uh, Council. Uh, got the twenty five thousand dollar grant. We're going to start a, a food drop off, big green cans. We went up to Scarsdale, did a trip, um, learned how they've been doing it for ten years. And then what we would like to see is taking the greens and the browns. Somebody mentioned that we've got an awful lot of yard trimmings on Long Island. And what we see that is in combination with the greens plus the browns to make something even like a peconic biomix. And they're already doing this down in uh, Southampton. Southampton is talking about doing this as a municipality right now. Um, East Hampton is doing it. They're using part public partners, public private partnerships to get this done. There are private organizations out here. Uh, we've got a lot of business models to jockey around, um, but this is um, this is where we're at. It's only part of the big picture. Um, we're getting uh, in the right place. Sorry, yeah, we're getting right now. If if I took all of the towns of the East End, we're going to be pulling forty four tons a day from the residential sector. Not a lot, and I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, thinking about Charlie's uh, thing. He's he's not going to be looking to help us convince three million people to scrape their plates into a green bucket. Right. So I think there's room for all of this, like putting rocks into a jar. There's room for pebbles and then there's room for sand. All of these one size only fits one. We're going to need all of these approaches to find out what great looks like. Uh, you've probably already seen this. I'm not going to belabor this, but uh, concentrating our efforts by material, I think, will uh, help us reach our set of missions independently, more easily breaking it up. Clothing is one of those things. And we we're starting to uh, put clothing into the template that we've been using for residential clothing waste, scraps, reuse, all the things we see today. Uh, all of these things, the food scraps, food scraps uh, to compost, anaerobic digestion, what does this mean for our regional economy? It means plenty. We know that there are jobs right now for careers which did not even exist 10 years ago. And that's what we're planning on for the next 10 years. Positions like dismantlers, reclaimers, repurposers, micro haulers, right? They've been doing this in this city for a lot of years already. And we have to ask this simple question of ourselves. What needs to be in place for Long Island to collaborate successfully to create a regional economy which makes use of the millions of tons of what could be resources? Nobody's old enough to remember, remember when cars uh, replaced Horses, uh, seen pictures, the shift took about a decade. I remember the unions panicking when PVC was rolled out to replace black iron pipe, pipe in the plumbing trade, uh, where two men, it took two men to carry a 10 foot length. It had to be cut, had to be threaded. Now one man could carry 10 lengths of a 10 foot PVC, but the shift in the work went into productivity. And instead of hundred feet of plumbing installed in a day, they were doing a thousand. I remember when the grocery workers union was losing a lot of sleep, when the barcode was invented. Everybody remember this? There was a lot of discussion on that. And they put it on millions and millions of stock keeping units, individual packages, and they just did it without any kind of, I don't know, they didn't ask me. So Johnny's going to lose his job by putting little yellow price stickers on every can of string beans. But what's he doing now? He's a database manager. He changes the prices on a computer overnight to reflect fluctuations in markets and doing profit analysis reports. So the point is that when we squeeze on one end of the economy, something else shows up as an opportunity somewhere else. The other question I'd like to keep us uh, in, in front of us right now is, is, what would great look like for our combined success? Thinking about great, not thinking about, I know, Charlie, you got over it. You, see, you mentioned all the, all the obstacles and the barriers and all the 
junk you got to go through. We got to get through that. Forget that, right? This thing, I just learned from somebody that, you know, SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunity threats. She said, just, just go with the strengths and opportunities because you waste a lot of energy and a lot of time worrying about what might not happen. Next time you're afraid to share your ideas, remember that someone once said in a meeting, let's make a film with a tornado full of sharks. <laughs> so our Sharknado comment then today is, what if we simply provided a path to zero waste, not by providing more services, turn this around for a minute, but by creating social programs comprised of those local services to be fulfilled by municipalities, entrepreneurs, or some combination of both. Now it is time to give people the guidance for this action. Now it is time for us to lead. Thank you. Okay, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're just going to uh, quickly move on, but we do have time for just one or two questions on, on in this one. Uh, anything about food waste or uh, composting or digesting? Yes. Thank you. Um, I love that last slide. My husband actually went to school with the Sharknado filmmaker, so I appreciate that. Um, on, on the and I appreciate the message of urgency and the need for circular economy. Uh, when we think about um, food waste and the hierarchy of food waste, uh, you know, th that hierarchy, I think it behooves us to recognize the food waste that is represented by even inherent in foods that are animal based. And that is something that. Uh, in terms of institutional shift, uh, I just want to share Greener by Default is a resource I hope everyone who's involved in institutional food service will, will look into because it uses behavioral economics to facilitate a shift away from animal-based foods to plant-based Heart, you know, carbon saving food. So greener by default. I, I'm just a fan. I have no involvement with them, but I, I wanted to lift that up because that's often missing when we are talking about food waste and food waste production. Good point. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, other questions? Yes. Question on the food compost. Um, what are the amount of food waste costs we're talking about in the economy? So I don't know what the conversion ratio is for food in the compost. My next question is is that large compost unit is able to dump our food? Is there a potential destination on markets for the tax body in the compost? Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the question for everybody is: Is is there right? If, if there is no markets, um, uh, is there recycling? It's, it's something we deal with all the time. Are we setting ourselves up, or is there a market for the, the material that we're going to be uh, that, that we're going to be generating uh, from, from these uh, digesters? Uh, Charles, we'll go to you, and I'll give you the mic. Well. Our engineering tells us that out of the 210,000 uh, tons of organics going to take in, there will be 25,000 tons of uh, compost uh, generated from this. To put it into perspective, Long Island compost produces about 250,000 tons of compost a year and has for decades. We have Sold, not given away, not disposed of, sold every single cubic yard of compost we ever produced. We believe we'll be able to handle the addition of 5,000 tons. But it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm saying that the compost is in a very significant time. More so than that, we actually get very much in our city, which is the residential side of the island. Is that by um, 45,000 tons a year? Yes, that 
Dr. Mark was the one so fun to do your evaluation. And Seth, maybe I can ask a question. I think you probably can do that as well. Yeah. I don't believe for any sort of team that, you know. Where is it going? so much for that. We're going to move on now and talk. Uh, up next is going to be our presentation, which is the roundtable uh, with the DEC and with uh, our supervisors from across Long Island. So if you'd like, just take a quick five-minute break, refill your coffee. Okay, so, we're so set welcome. Up My name is John Cameron. I'm the uh, managing partner of Cameron Engineering Associates. I also serve as the chair of the Long Island Regional Planning Council and uh, been honored to have been asked to serve as the moderator for this uh, panel here today. So um, if I can, I'd like to introduce our panel here. My left, we have uh, Supervisor Ed Romain of the town of Brookhaven. Supervisor Grid Schaefer, town of Babylon. Supervisor Angie Carpenter for the town of Isla. Supervisor Ed Wareheim for the town of Smithtown. And Dave Vitale from the New York State DEC. So the purpose of the roundtable today is to discuss thoughts and ideas on the critical issue of solid waste management here on Long Island. I'd like to thank the Lipless Scholarship Committee for arranging these symposiums which give us the opportunity to learn how the private public sectors are successfully working together to manage solid waste and to discuss the challenges that still remain and possible solutions to those challenges. We all know that it, it is quote unquote successful because the system works. Each and every week, 2.9 million Long Islanders put out the garbage at the curb and somehow it disappears. Well, at least it seems to disappear. At the same time, tens of thousands of businesses on Long Island here, restaurants, grocery stores, and other establishments toss away their garbage that miraculously goes away. <laughs> and here at the symposium, we're going to take a deeper dive and examine the innovative technologies and best practices for managing that solid waste. Clearly, the challenge is great and we need region-wide solutions to effectively manage our waste management issues. There is, however, clearly a looming crisis that will substantially increase our dependence upon off-island transport and disposal of waste, including MSW, ash, and CND. Currently, thousands of tons of MSW, and CND, and biosol solids are already trucked off Long Island each day. A portion of CND is also shipped off the island by rail for disposal out of state. The town of Brookhaven's landfill is scheduled to close in two years. When that happens, much more waste will need to be transported off Long Island, which if hauled by truck will result in increased congestion, greater air pollution and stress on our already burdened highway infrastructure, and of course, higher costs. I've introduced our, our members of our roundtable today. And as a moderator, I will ask them questions and give them an opportunity to, to discuss the issue and, and some thoughts they may have on some possible solutions. At the end of our panel's discussion, I'll open it up to the audience for questions and further discussion. So let me start with the questions. Firstly, to my left, I have Supervisor Romain. So I guess we can call this the hot seat. Since he has he has one of uh, two 
I guess Asheville's and uh, remaining on Long Island here, it's scheduled to close in uh, 2024. So Ed, maybe you can share some information about that. Is the landfill going to close? And uh, your thoughts on what we should be doing with the waste after that. Thank you. Uh, I ran for supervisor in a special election in 2012. At the time, the supervisor that left in the middle of his term was Mark Glesko. The board uh, was of a different political composition than it is now. He had proposed taking the landfill, which is at 270 feet, to 325 feet. As a candidate in a special election, I opposed that. The minute I opposed that, I knew that the landfill would close because you're not raising a landfill, there's only so much space. So we planned, once I was elected, for the closure of the landfill. And we announced, I think it was in 2018, that the landfill would close in 2024 based on our projections. We are still holding that. Right now, the town of Brookhaven has taken garbage. The, the landfill was built by the State uh, Environmental Facilities Corporation in 1972 and turned over to the town in 1974. Um, the town used it as a landfill for municipal solid waste. Back in 1989, the town made a decision to stop taking garbage and entered into what was called the Astra Trash Field with the Covanta plant in Hampstead. Right now, the two major things we take in the landfill is ash and construction debris. Based on an analysis, we plan to close the landfill in 2024. We did not count on the pandemic, which dropped construction debris way down, leaving additional space in the landfill. We made a decision as a town that we will stop taking construction debris as of December 31st, 2024. But if there's any room left over, and again, we're regulated by DEC, they give us the permit for each of the cells of the landfill, then we will take ash probably for another one or two years until that cell is filled up. And that's it, it's over. So then we have to deal with the reality of life, which is why, we're not only looking, we understand that landfill is not allowed on Long Island as a result of laws passed by the state of 1980. I worry about the construction industry because there's only two sites on Long Island, two, that accept construction. We're one, the other one is one pen sand and gravel. So what do you think is going to happen if you're in the construction industry? It's happening already all over our town which is why we've doubled and tripled our fines for dumping, because people are dumping all over the place. But that's our plan for the landfill. But it's also our plan, and today, uh, the town board and I are moving towards, on a gradual basis, step-by-step, step, a zero-waste program. So we're going to adopt a zero-waste program, just like our friends who ran this facility, all of this, this little meeting, this is a zero waste facility that we are in today. There will be no leftovers. Everything will be recycled or be reused. So we're moving to that. But we need allies. We need allies with DEC. Where's Dr. Frank Withell from Stony Brook? Stand up, Frank. There he is. <laughs> DEC said you should recycle glass. Glass is one of the largest contaminants in recycling. We wanted to use it for other things. Dr. Rathel did a study with people who started Brook to give to the DEC that glad there's no market for glass as it currently exists. Would the DEC create a market? Overnight, glass can be used as an aggregate in concrete. It can be used for a whole host of other things. The same is true for ash. You all came here this morning? On your way out, look. Look at the boathouse that they built in 1989 out of ash from Brookhaven. They just tested that. It's stronger today than the day it was built. But can we get uses for ash? What's called a bud beneficial use determination? Where is that? Where is that for the DEC? They need to be our partners. 
if we're going to get to zero waste, what about a bigger, better bottle bill? Where is that? What about the packaging legislation, which I strongly endorse that Adrian has campaigned so hard for? Where is that? We need partners. We don't have partners. We need partners. This isn't going to be where the DEC can be the regulator instead of the innovators. We need them to move to be the innovators and work with the towns, the villages, and more importantly, the county. Right now, we're all separate towns. We talk to each other because we're friends and we've been in government for a long time. But I'm going to tell you, the county of Suffolk is going to step in at some point and take a lead role to help the town. Is that January 1st? <laughs> We're going to step in and take the lead role with our towns because together we're stronger and we have to convince the state to change their approach to help us in a gradual program to graduate to zero waste. It's only going to work if we've got cooperation from the state, the county, and the towns. If we don't have that, and of course the private sector, if we don't have that type of cooperation, it's not going to happen. So the time for action is now. I said this several years ago, the people, when we were, when the, your organization had that conference, that the crisis was now, well, it's the past now. So we cannot delay, we cannot wait. The future of this island is dependent on this. And there are many reasons why people leave the state. We have lost more population as a percentage than any other state in the United States. There's a lot of different reasons for that. But one of the things is we need government to operate far more efficiently and cooperatively than they've operated to the point. So I'll end on that. I'll return oh my good God. friend and say thank you. Last so now we have from the town of Babylon, the actually the only other town on Long Island which actually has an Asheville and a resource recovery plan and a recycling facility. Richie, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts? Well, I think I think what Ed what Ed uh, talked about, and I I think he said it very well. I uh, don't mean to beat up on But in all, in all seriousness, though, and I think Ed, Ed's point is is well taken because in it, it, it uh, if, if you hear a sense of frustration in his voice, just in terms of, uh, you don't hear that, Adrian? No. I thought he was channeling his best Adrian. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> She doesn't and I support the packaging legislation. It should be law. Yeah. So, so, and 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 I think what Ed, what the point that Ed's bringing out, I'm just going to pick up on one particular point because something that we're very involved in now is uh, is ash and coming up with what do we do with both the existing facility that we've got, the cells that we've got at our facility. Tom Betry is here. He's our commissioner of environmental control. Doug Jacob who's um, uh, worked with me for 30, over 30 years now. Uh, and we're talking about and have just gotten responses to an RFP because, uh, and, and I like what you talked about, I'll tell you a quick story. So during COVID, Mike Basilico, you all know, and Mike has, is kind of ahead of his time in terms of what he's doing. He's got that great wash plant, which is uh, operating in uh, farming, East Farmingdale and does a terrific job at taking the, the worst of the worst and putting it through this Rubik's Cube operation. And at the end, you've got just a little bit left that he's now figured out he can take that, you know, five, 10% of material that's left after it's gone through all of its processes and uh, take that, use glass that we have at our recycling facility picked up from our residents. Uh, and uh, take another uh, material that will be put together to create these pellets. So Mike said, uh, I'm, a, I'm in Bermuda. I want to meet you for dinner. Uh, meet me at the uh, Frances Francesco's in Babylon Village. Okay. We're sitting outside because they've got the tables. It is a thunderstorm. 
lightning, and he's got this bag of materials, right? The waitress looked at me. It was almost like I could have mouthed, help me. <laughs> because she was looking at, he took out ash, he took out that. <laughs> and she was, are you guys ordering anything? I think so. <laughs> in, in a couple of minutes. And he's explaining that he had just been at a conference. They were telling him, and, and he's Clemson graduate. Uh, and that's why a lot of, he's, he's very... Uh, analytical and he's always kind of thinking ahead and my guys get nervous because they're like oh did you have another meeting with Mike Basilico <laughs> what, what's the next thing we're going to have in our town and by the way I'm proud that we have the wash plant and I'm proud that he's been doing um, sort of a study at our landfill for the last two years I think this he, had, he and I met probably back in 20 in the summer of 20 and uh, he literally came together because he won his company won the contract to uh, do the resiliency on the end of uh, Manhattan Island. Sandy, during Sandy, they put out the bid. So he said, in between the bulkheading and the land, you need this space fill. And what I'm paying for now, we can help create and we can reduce your capacity in the Asheville cells by taking that material, taking your glass, and uh, Putting and taking the uh, the waste product from the uh, uh, the uh, wash plant and creating these pellets that I now pay a lot of money for, and so he was one of the responders. There's another organization here uh, that I understand met with Winters yesterday that responded uh, to that, and they've got a great proposal also as to what they can do with our ash. So we're in the business now of figuring out how to reduce. The ash that Covanta generates uh, that um, uh, is there and lessen that capacity. We're good through 32, um, 2032. Uh, and I guess well, I'll, I'll be on my 18th term at that <laughs> point, unless Ed hires me next year. Yeah, yeah. Um, the possibility. But, um, but, but, <laughs> the possibility. well, they said for us to liven it up. It said it's been pretty boring. So. <laughs> You can do a <laughs> yeah. So, so again, uh, we're looking to figure out, and we have to figure out because I don't want to. They say to me, "Well, are we going to go to DEC and expand capacity or not?" No, because that's that's going to be something they're not interested in, and our taxpayers aren't going to be interested in. They want us to figure out how to deal with the situation because if you're talking about, and John mentioned this, a closed system, Tony Noto. Tony Noto, and I give him a lot of credit. In fact, I, right before he passed away, he came to me and, and I said, Tony, you deserve full credit because you went out in 83 and started taking action to put in place a um, system that was going to be self-contained. We wouldn't have to rely on anybody else. And over those years, Arthur Pitts, then me, then Steve Ballone, we've continued that mantra in Babylon. So we've been able to take care of our own problems in-house now we've got, we're facing this major problem with what to do with the ash. And I think the brains and all of the, and, and Dr. Uh, uh, Frank in the back there uh, has been an advisor to us. I think that the brains can come up with how to utilize what's out there now. Great, great, great. thanks. Our next panelist uh, also has a resource recovery plan that uh, generates ash and also a uh, yard waste composting plan, actually the uh, largest operation in New York State. And also a, uh, a MRF, which I proudly say uh, my firm designed and built 35 years ago, still operating today, Angie. So Angie Carpenter, Town of Isom. Angie, maybe you could share some ideas as to what you see as solid waste challenges for the town in the next few years. Well, I think both uh, Rich and Ed have uh, shared that. Uh, I have it off, but the watch isn't going off, unfortunately. Um, so the county is <laughs> That was early. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say I'm I'm we're re really blessed in the town of Isla because we've got Marty Ballou uh, as our commissioner, uh, heads up our resource recovery agency and DPC, and also uh, working with us is Mike Kate, and these guys know it all. I don't, so I'm very lucky. But uh, one of the things that Ed said, and, and Rich too, that I think really needs reinforcing is the idea that we need to work together. Uh, individually, we're not coming up with the answers, but the answers are there. 
the solutions are out there. The brain power is there. We just have to channel it. And I think we have to look at the state. I mean, back in 1988, when the Solid Waste Act was passed, uh, that was the beginning of the state working together with us and uh, creating that partnership and possibly hasn't been as strong as it should have been or could have been. But I think things like what is happening here today and having to see brave enough to sit at the table with us, <laughs> and, uh, we're very blessed with that. I know Rock, uh, Rock Baraka is on the regional rep has been very uh, accessible and supportive. But I think we can do it. I really, really do. We just have to face it head on. And having someone like Ed Romaine, who is obviously so passionate about this, knows so much about it, we are going to get there. So, you know, we stand ready. We are already ready cooperating as far as towns go. Um, we have a partnership with Smithtown and Hudson Bay on recyclables. We have a partnership with Brookhaven and Huntington and Ash. So we are working together and the willingness and the desire is there to work together. And certainly I think by the time this um, symposium is over today, you will see that the passion is there on the part of all of us for uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have Ed Wehrheim, who's supervisor for the town of Smithtown, who is actually collaborating with other towns. As Angie has mentioned, you have sending recyclables down there, and your uh, and your waste is going to the Huntington Cobanta facility. Correct. Correct. So, what do you see as challenges to to the town, Ed? Well, um, as you say, John, and thank you all for having us here. Um, we have a bi-town agreement with the town of Huntington, where we bring all our municipal solid waste. Um, it gets incinerated at Commander. Um, the ash is then taken to Ed's landfill. We have recyclables, uh, commingled glass and metal that we have agreements with uh, Town of Islip, with Angie, um, and that goes down there. So I think it illustrates the cooperation effort from the local level of supervisors is certainly there. We have a multiple service facility. Um, Mike Engelman is our director of solid waste. David Barnes, Environment Waterways, and Councilman Loman is here who oversees those operations. Um, they are working very, very well. Um, we are looking at the possibility of a public-private partnership um, with a, a, a town line rail um, private entity that's looking uh, with the transportation, the safety transportation board as we speak about putting rail service there. I know that. Uh, yeah, Pank, it has uh, the same thing going with uh, with Will and Winter Brothers. So we're all looking and cooperating to find solutions. What I will say is, I mean, it's and it's been said by the panel. This is not. We're not going to uh, fix this as a re This is a regional issue. It's not a local issue. It's very, very difficult for us on a local level to make people understand it. I I was joking before. Um, Perhaps every taxpaying resident in the town of Smithtown should have to come to this symposium and actually see what is actually going on. Right? Many people I speak to on opposition to things we do, quite frankly, don't even know where their trash goes. If you ask them, they have no idea. John, as you said, it magically disappears. So, nor do they care. So, um, collectively, we're all working. We work every day together. We talk every day together. We've been this group of supervisors has done it um, for years. Um, and solutions are out there. We just have to make sure that we have a regional approach to it, in my opinion. Dave, um, you have to participate. I think the federal government has to participate um, on a funding level. One other issue that we've taken up is fit down. We began STEM programs with two of the school districts. The reason we did that, we think it's a better avenue to teach the students who have a keen interest that we had some here today and then take that home to the parents. Because I will tell you, and I don't I speak for myself, when you speak to the adults in these homes, they could care less, right. unfortunately. So, but it's our job to make it happen. So I think we can. That's a great point. Right. It was actually, if I, if I may just show my age here, but going back to the late eighties when on uh, Long Island, and we started the advent of recycling programs. The only reason it really took off 
was the education in the schools. So the kids so, came home and they taught. Yes. Why, why are you throwing everything out there? We should be reciting. It was peer right. pressure. It was the pressure of the kids on their parents. So you're absolutely right. Yes. So I think yes. and that's where we got to get back into the schools, get them educated. Yes. We have education. Is, is we have two school, school districts now, and we have other school districts um, inquiring about how they get involved. So and, you know, that's a good point. I want to uh, introduce Rich Grow, who's uh, everybody knows Rich, and he's got uh, Greg Gaxiola with him. And, uh, but Rich and I and the team uh, have been talking about it. In fact, we're putting it together because we noticed a decline in in certain neighborhoods. You know, we have a lot of um, turnover in our town, I would say, from when I was supervised in the 90s to supervising now through the 2010s, uh, probably about 25% turnover of new residents who've moved from the city uh, and had different education as to how to dispose of their waste. So we're literally uh, developing a campaign and Rich runs our Earth Day program, which is usually the first uh, Saturday in May. Yes, correct. Yeah, uh, May 6th this year. May 6th, and we're gonna have that at Geiger Park, but a main point of that is to kick off a major education campaign about recycling, getting people to talk about the packaging bill, uh, how to do recycling and uh, creating your own compost. Well, all those things are going to be part of that. We're going to spend a year-long effort to educate and doing it in different languages. So we've got, um, and if you take a look at the last census data that came out, we saw that about 20% of our uh, town's population is now Spanish or Spanish-speaking, uh, Creole, uh, Polish. So we've got it going in a number of languages that we're going to entertain that and we'll probably reach out to you, Adrian, for your help, since you have great people who go door to door and uh, uh, getting that word out and having that dialogue going on how to educate them. Great. We Thanks. actually have yes, in the town of Isaac a recycling coordinator that goes into the schools cool. and talks about the recycling program and then offers tours of our facilities. Okay. We do too. We have a recycling coordinator goes to schools and civics. Uh, and we are very, very Active waste management commission. Give away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's okay. Christine Fenton. She's trying to hide. Right. So, this is part of the program that's called Payback Time. So, now, <laughs> <laughs> now we have Dave Vitale, who's been brave enough to come here and sit up here by himself. And uh, so, now you get the last word for at least for, for a time, Dave, and maybe you could share with us. <laughs> You know, yeah, what's the latest on the state process stuff? out permits? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? <laughs> what's the latest on the uh, state solid waste management plan? I believe it's it's been probably 13 years since it's been initiated. And maybe you could talk about how you see the changes that are being incorporated there, how they that could be helping to move us towards quote unquote the goal of zero waste. <laughs> okay. Um let me, uh, I'll, I'll round it out with the state plan, if you don't mind. Let me, uh, sure. uh, hear some of the spirited presentation um, and some of the comments that were made. Um, the, uh, the most encouraging thing to me out of this entire uh, symposium has been the level of interest is amazing. The, uh, the various opportunities for cooperation has been expressed and uh, from the other presentations and hearing it from the, the supervisors is really, is really, really important and encouraging. Uh, I have been working with the, with solid waste in Long Island for decades. So um, there are a couple interesting things that were uh, initially mentioned about uh, where's the how can we do glass and that could be done tomorrow? It could have been 20 years ago because that has been in the regulations and opportunities for that for a beneficial use process. There's predetermined beneficial uses. DOT has had specifications existing for 20 years. Just people don't use them and come in. Municipalities haven't used them and come in. Some of the challenges for businesses with that is aggregating, believe it or not, enough of the material in order to do their projects. So that already exists and has for decades. It's the same with ash. Um, so I know we're concerned about ash. The department's been concerned about ash ever since combustors were built. 
Uh, we've always encouraged uh, the beneficial use of ash. We've had regulations in place for 30 years. That's how Dr. Rothel was able to build the, the boathouse. Uh, we haven't had the applications until very recently. So we've had two applications come in very recently for um, beneficial use of ash. And we're very, very encouraged and thrilled that we finally have these things so that we can collectively move toward it. Um, the other piece, there were a couple of mentions of uh, waste management back in the 90s. And uh, I have to say, it was uh, there was a, uh, an amazing effort uh, put in by DEC, by uh, the towns at the time, trying to work together to come up with solutions. Uh, legislation passed uh, and the local solid waste management planning requirements went into uh, effect back in uh, the laws of 1988, Solid Waste Management Act. Uh, recycling laws had to take effect by 92. But all of those pieces in motion, it also put some funding programs in motion that then the state implements. That's the state's responsibility, providing support, reviewing, putting regulations in place, those are what we're authorized to do by the legislature. Uh, planning units, local municipalities, or home rule state. So responsibility, primacy for waste management falls to local municipalities. So we each have our role and we each need to support each other. I do say that uh, over the time, the, we've had many, many programs DC has provided funding for. So we go back to the initial combustors. <clears throat> Some of the towns receive significant funding from the department for the initial construction of those. We've had landfill closure. We have closed all the landfills. Towns have received significant funding from the state. That recycling programs, towns have received significant funding for that. If you put all of our programs, household hazardous waste, um, it's uh, recycling education as well as capital. If you put all that together, the department has invested $100 million from that time, just in Long Island with these municipalities. These municipalities alone, Brookhaven alone received over 12 million. They received more waste, uh, more uh, grants for recycling than any other town, $6 million, over $6 million. Uh, the recycling coordinators, they identified as partially funded by grant programs with DEC. So I believe that the department has been a partner um, within what we're authorized to do. Our authorizations are create the regulations, create the paths for people to use, try to draw interest in. And we don't force, we can't tell you, build this facility, don't build this facility. If it meets our regulations, build the facility. That's our obligations and that's our cooperation. It's also through the local planning. Most of, most of the towns had local plans. They started in the early 90s. So 90, 91, 92, 93, most of them. Uh, uh, past local plans have had them in place. Most of the initial ones were 20 years. Um, not all the towns have come up with their final uh, new plans uh, or replacement plans. Uh, we have uh, uh, Smithtown um, has, Isla has. So they're in place. Nine of the 15, 16 planning units in Long Island have new plans in place. We do not. So these plans, the initial plans expired in 2009, 10, 12, there's a lot in place. Planning is so important. That's when you get to look at, that's when you look at your numbers. That's when you look at your opportunities for throwing in businesses, moving material, looking for beneficial use uh, and cooperation. And at those opportunities to cooperate with other municipalities if possible, or to realize how important it is for um, for waste management with the private sector. Private sector deals with the vast majority, and this will bring me back to the, to bring me to the final point of the state solid waste management plan. So if you look across the state, um, when we talk about municipal solid waste, a little over half of that, about 55%, 54% is residential, 46% is commercial. All the commercials collected by privates, all the commercials managed by privates. Municipal, the municipal side, the residential side in New York State, uh, if you look at the direct collection by municipalities, it's 30 
six percent. And so if you take that out, if you take the city of New York out, you drop to 16 percent direct collection by municipalities. So that's a huge, a huge component for from the, the uh, private side. And so we need privates. The privates are an integral partner as well. And we need to recognize this. We need to know what our responsibilities are and all work together as much as we can, get as creative as we can within our structures to help each other and move it along. So the state solid waste management plan, we have been working on it for a while. The last plan was uh, a 10 year plan. Uh, was, uh, so that was 2020, it expired. We started our planning process in uh, 2018, 2019, had stakeholder meetings, but we got in the way a little bit. Um, so that delayed us a hair. And then one of the important things that was talked about at the beginning was the Climate Act, the Climate Act Act. And so now we had this opportunity to have that input and that expertise evaluated. A waste panel was created, 12% of the, of the greenhouse gases from waste. So we said it's important for us to wait until after that, embrace all of that expertise that, um, that was part of that process and then move forward with uh, finalizing our draft plan. And so actually today, um, it should be um, noticed in the EMB, our draft plan, um, and today, so I'm not sure when it goes up, four o'clock, something like that, somewhere in that zone. And so then that'll be up on the web and we're gonna start um, a 60 day public comment period on it. And we want input. There's uh, gonna be a, a stakeholder meeting, a virtual one, uh, April, I think believe 11th, somewhere in there, we want comment. We, this is important to us. It's important to hear all of those thoughts. Look at what those pieces are. If you talk about the, the, the packaging, where is it? That's legislation. They have to do this. We've been pushing this. It's in the, it's in the waste uh, plant. It's in the state plant. We've been talking about this for even longer. Uh, packaging for 30 years we've been doing this. We've talked about this when we were, people looked at us like we were from Pluto. Um, and here it is. This is amazing to see, but it's important. That's, that's a change forcing action. That makes the difference. That one does. And we, in the plan, uh, the climate plan, you'll see three big uh, uh, recommendations for legislation. You'll see them again, not surprisingly, and the state's always been a plan. In, in addition to another 150 or so uh, action items that uh, this, the department can take. Um, but a lot of it is legislation. We don't make the laws. We, we create the regulations to implement them. And we enforce it. And, and John, I want to thank Dave because next week at this time, we're going to be in a working group with the 10 town supervisors from Suffolk House Association is meeting with Dave and his staff and Rob Calarco um, to sit and talk about the specifics so that we know today was meant to be uh, informational, but we actually have work to do and with our uh, professionals. You know, yeah, Dave brought up the point. Of the, sorry. Yeah. Dave's uh, comment about they don't make yeah, laws. Uh, 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 if there are a lot of interaction with legislators, with the lawmakers, with your agencies, and show them what's going to be responsible for it. Because having been part of a legislative body as both uh, Supervisor Romaine and um, Supervisor Schaefer have been, as I have been, a lot of times I've seen it happen. You know, people have an idea and they think it's a good idea and they pass the law without really realizing, is this doable, practical? So whatever we can do to encourage lawmakers to sit with you before legislation is passed and not try to deal with it after the fact. Well, um, it, uh, it, it yeah. comes in the, that, um, that spirit of cooperation comes and goes. Um, it, it, at times it's higher than other times. Depending on the personality. Uh, <laughs> we, um, our, our agency um, certainly communicates with the governor's office, but we don't have that direct necessary com communication with legislators. Uh, it's up to them to um, to decide how, uh, how involved and who they want. Well, I'm just talking to the governor, ask her about housing. 
And no, yes, all right. 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 This is all my opportunity. What I'll, what I'll say is, Dave, if you need us, we will we need you to ask our Please. delegation because, again, we're going to spend a few hours next Wednesday going over this. And, and Ed's got uh, Dan, uh, Councilman Dan Panico is bringing in someone from Pennsylvania about uh, glass. Uh, we've got a number of people coming in to talk about. So, on the private sector, guys, that could help us reduce the waste. And I think, and I think also just one point on that, and you know, people are talking numbers and what happens if Brookhaven closes. You know, we as as uh, officials, and I know you've worked very hard. You've got a permitted site on Peconic Avenue that can take additional waste. Uh, you've got a <laughs> well, it's a great shop. And, and again, we're taught, we're pointing out people, but again, to stay ahead of the plan that Brookhaven has set in motion. Um, Local towns are taking action, not um, hiding in the corner and saying we can't move ahead with this. And 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 Ed in uh, Smithtown is considering a, a proposal now, which you know I, I got to give them kudos for for forcing the conversation, the town board, Councilman Loman, to say we've got to talk about this. We can't. This isn't about uh, saying okay, we're not gonna we're gonna listen to one particular area or another. This has got to be a solution that's found with everybody shouldering the burden um, in order to accomplish it. Otherwise, we're going to be drowning in it. And that's why kudos to Supervisor Romain and the town board for getting Peconic Avenue up and running. That handles almost 600,000 tons of waste that when Brookhaven closes, they're going to be able to accept that. MJ Boulevard um, is another one that uh, is permitted and be able to handle those wastes. So, when you're adding up the numbers, and I know you said, Dave, the way you do it is when you have the solid waste plans from each municipality, you can show where each municipality is sending their tonnage of waste. And we do the same thing in Babylon. And so I think what we need to do is look at the million, the million or so tons that you accept in of various types of waste and see that there are actually facilities already being able to take that waste we have um, in right? when we're calculating right and uh, and uh, they did a great job at getting that and yeah Linda Hurst to respond to that facility which used to be all total yep exactly so and that's why and Angie made this reference that she's very happy to have professionals who can tell her because I'm not I'm no expert in fact when I came back as supervisor Said so you're not going to have me talking about garbage again, are you? And uh, they said, "Well, wait till you see what we've got in store for you." And I'm lucky to have the team that I that I pointed out here, um, and that's really what what does it for us. Is I'd rather listen to professionals. I'd rather be talking to Will. I'd rather be talking to Kevin, Joe Ritigliano. I mean, I could point out there Patricia DiMatteo, Joe Winters, God rest his soul, Michael White. Those and are the kind of all be digested. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah, yes. They, uh, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie. Charlie, of course. And uh, I'm glad it's in Yapang, not in that uh, one, one second, please. If I, I will Just open the communities. Up absolutely. One second, please. You will. Well, you will. well you, if you look at my record, you've heard it for 30 years. So, and that's the way we've operated. If, if I may, look at me. Respect. Well, with all due respect, I'm in Babylon. You can talk to our community. Okay, we will. Yep. If I if I may, please. Yep. If if I may, I'm sorry. I'm gonna open it up to the community after we finish with a couple of more questions here. Okay. Okay. Well, you can take my place if you want. <laughs> so one one thing that's been very cl very clear today, and you hear it from the from the towns, is while they're separate and distinct towns, um, they all have share. We all share common problems, and frankly, I think if you if you look at this. The solutions, uh, it's going to take us, it's not the village, but it's going to take the towns, it's going to take everybody working together. You brought up, I'll give you just an example. Let's talk about glass. People, oh, it's just glass. Well, a lot of people may not realize that when you put out the waste, most of the waste on the island go into resource recovery plants, okay? The towns are paying for the waste to go in and the glass that's in there, they're paying in a tip fee to go in, into the, uh, the front door at the resource recovery plant, right? Glass is part of that. We don't if they don't recycle it, it's going in as part of the garbage. What happens 
The incinerator burns, burns 1800 degrees or whatever. What comes out part of the ash? Glass. So the town is paying on the front door and they're also paying on the back door, whether it's in the resource recovery plan contract or not, they're paying twice for the glass. Because right now you look and say, it's difficult to recycle glass. Well, there are markets for glass and Ed you know, talked about the counties, but what we could be doing, we could be specking and it's not necessarily DEC, but the state and DOT specs, the county and their specs, road specs, the towns, villages, you could be requiring a certain amount of glass aggregate that goes into, just could be even in drainage, in drainage pools, et cetera. There's things we can do, but it's gonna take leadership. And Rich is talking about next week, they have 10 town supervisors talking about it. We need to start talking about collaboratively, whether it's on glass, ash recycling, or you look at like even storm debris. We had Hurricane Sandy, okay? Town of Brookhaven took the majority of the of the of the demolition debris and the storm debris uh, from Superstorm Sandy, as they did with Hurricane Gloria uh, decades ago. Say, why can't we get together as towns and collaboratively? We also have the three Nassau uh, the three, yeah. yeah, but thank you. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And three Nassau towns supervisor Clavin had a conflict; he couldn't make it. But candidly, we have thirteen towns here. We have. And we talk about this on Long Island, we talk about on the planning council. You know, we always pride ourselves on home rule, okay? But sometimes, you know, what strengthens us also weakens us because that home rule can actually turn into balkanization and everybody says, well, that's my problem. Uh, that's their problem, it's not my problem. Frankly, garbage and waste management is everybody's problem. And we're gonna hear from the community, okay? Community has a right to speak. We get that, but the waste you pick it up from the curb, it's got to go somewhere. It just can't be, it's going nowhere. We need to minimize the amount we're generating. We need to maximize the amount that's being recycled. We talked about that. You've heard it from a number of speakers today, but it's still the remaining waste has to go someplace. So we should be working on siting and getting solutions implemented, reducing the waste stream, but collaboratively, the 10 towns should get together and say, what can we do? Ed's talked about bringing in a private company, talked about utilization of glass, recycling of glass. There's, there's technologies out there, but frankly, anybody who's been involved on siting facilities, you need to have a supply. It's, it's, it's su supply and demand. If you don't have a sufficient supply, you could say, oh, let the private sector do it. They're not gonna build a facility and, and on spec and, and never have anybody show up. They're gonna go bankrupt. They're gonna go out of business. You need to have contracts where, where the towns are committing, we'll commit our glass recycling to this facility. Because right now they're all on their own. Yeah. Each prostate, prostate facility, whether it's Omni, whether it's Winters, or it's any of them out there, they're on their own. We need to start collaborating so there's a critical mass. Otherwise, these, these facilities are not getting built. So, yeah, and also, John, there's, um, I know we all agree, there's a fiscal issue here on a local level as well. Sure. One third of my operating budget is solid waste. Exactly. One third of the operating budget. Exactly. exactly. And we all and know we get 11 and a half cents on a dollar because of the school districts and the distribution to the county. So it's not a lot of money for us to really work. And we know this with the towns. We've heard it before, too, because we, people complain, you know, the two things on Long Island that people hate the most, taxes and traffic. Well, the taxes are really two thirds to 70 percent. It's the schools. OK, so that's fine. So you have towns. Counties, villages, et cetera, police budgets, et cetera. So they're trying to manage solid waste here, recognizing that candidly costs are going to go up. So how do you handle that one there with, with your with your electorate and without trying to minimize and the tax cap? One thing that I right. would yes. like to bring forward, and, and please forgive me with the DEC, uh, <laughs> if you could review your grant process, the reimbursement process, because we've been waiting. 10 years for a $2 million grant uh, on the closure of uh, an SW facility at Weinberg. It's with you. You know, it's with you for five well, now I think <laughs> I'll defer to the commissioner if he wants to get into the details with you later. But, if the, if the, uh, we'll if probably have that conversation. Yeah, that that conversation. So, but I, if I may, I'd just like to ask each of the town supervisors here, trying to move forward here with a plan of action. Would each of you commit to working collaboratively 
with other towns to try and develop these regional solutions? Because candidly, otherwise you mentioned DEC and talk about planning. I have we already planning. have everything else is advised. We, 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 okay. we meet constantly about these issues. No, but but, but Ed, if I may, okay, it's not just meeting. You talk about we're willing to sign on to a joint procurement, a yes. joint procurement, sure. and we will provide Absolutely. our glass. Sure. We will provide. We yeah. found we yeah. found during COVID, and we were meeting regularly. And you know some of the good things that came out of COVID, we were doing Zooms literally every day. Right. And with our colleagues in Nassau, uh, Supervisor Clavin, Saladino, and uh, at the time uh, Judy Bosworth, and uh, we were able to collaborate and do procurements and Absolutely. get supply. So we saw that that was something positive that came out and we you, can do you that. Have, you have the material, which and, the and private sector will step up. There's no doubt in mind. You'll get competitive we'll, proposals. We will commit and I'll, we'll bring it up again next week. And Good. we'll, we'll I guess great. we'll sign the Magna Carta or. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I'd like to open up to a few questions. Okay, if, if I may, okay, it just. Yes, ma'am. Well, if, if do me a favor, just identify yourself. If you have an affiliation, if not, just where you live. Okay. Hi, my name is Project Ricky, and I'm the president of the Blue Haven Town NAACP. Well, and so I have a question here. I did submit it as was requested, but I haven't heard it addressed. Can we uh, demystify the fact that there is a crisis? That's one, because unfortunately, and thankful to the DEC, they have just permitted two new sites. Right? And those two new sites are able to handle way more tons per day than is necessary. And there is a leftover of 5,000 tons left a day. Where is that going to come from? Are we continuing to take in New York City's trash? This proposed site in Brookhaven. Which, well, I don't know which one you're talking about. about. It's all about rail sites. The oh. rail sites, the okay. whole thing. Okay. We believe that this is a marketing scheme employed, this whole idea of a crisis, because it has been averted. We see here that the landfill in Brookhaven takes 1.1 million tons of CMD a year. We also know that DEC has approved two new facilities that take in about 1.28 million of tons, about 136 tons a year. So the question is simple, where is the crisis? We see that there has been a change. Secondly, the fact that Brentwood and Brookhaven, so when we think about these two sites that went through their local zone, we're talking about home rule here. Our community, myself included, with Blog, who was here representing the North Belport community, the BIPOC people, the elephant in the room, why do we have to have our voice be stricken by the Winter Brothers, who has an application STB, and we are not allowed to have local rule and have this process come through the town of Brookhaven. We have spoke over and over again. There is no crisis. This is a man-made crisis. There's an extra tonnage that can be taken in day and is not being used. As the DEC said, 16% versus 36%. We have to stop telling these lies, and it needs to be, as was said earlier, that every community should do its share, and it shouldn't be on the backs of brown, black, and indigenous people. Okay, thank you. I think, you know, candidly, you no, know, there's a number of, of projects. I'm sorry, that's to the supervisors. Okay. I'd like an answer. Well, first of all, we're not trying to address any specific project today. We're talking about a, a region wide problem. There is it's regional wide. You said it's a crisis. If there is a crisis, we see here that all of these two permits you're be talking, the two different But you're areas. just you're talking about the probably the permitted capacity of uh, those facilities. Right. No, I'm talking about this crisis that you said exists. Where is yes. this crisis? The crisis, well, as you said there, earlier, there, there won't be a crisis rest. as long as the garbage leaves your curb. The crisis will no, be when that's been told. That the, the crisis is what are we going to do when Brookhaven landfill closes? Well, what are we going to do? We have two new facilities that take in enough, more than is needed. There is no crisis. Please well, they're not, tell me they're, they're not taking, they're not, I'm not going to speak up, but they're not taking that in today. You're talking about but, uh, permitted okay. capacity, right? So, speak answers to the issue of the crisis, yes or no? I don't, I don't know that. I don't know the answer, but we need to stop saying it's a crisis because it is not true. 
It is a marketing scheme to further the interests of the Winter Brothers and not the people, and especially the people that live less than 1.3 miles from the shenanigans with everything else. That we pay the same taxes and we don't get any relief, but the lowest expectancy life is what's in our community. Anybody like comment? I, I'll certainly say uh, that with the brothers has no application to any rail facility before Brookhaven Town at this time. That's right. Escaping local rule and going straight to STB, thereby distinguishing our voice and our ability to be civically engaged on a local level. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. These issues uh, have been around a long time. I have some concern that they will continue to be around for decades to come. This is a university, and in this room are students. And those students might be the leaders of the future who inherit and continue to work on these problems. So I'm going to ask the people in this room uh, to lead by example about how you have a respectful deliberative conversation the community should be heard everyone should be heard you have just raised a question about the crisis i haven't heard it answered but your question is on the table and it, either we have an answer or someone pursues it and gets back to you i saw about six hands going up and so while students are watching, we don't yell out our comments. We raise our hand and have a respectful, deliberative. I'm sorry, I'm not yelling. I just speak loud. <laughs> With all due respect, she wasn't pounding like he was when he was talking. So you really shouldn't be saying anything for that long. Excuse, excuse me, if I may, let's, let's not just shout out. Hey, well, come on. I wasn't speaking to anyone, except I did say that I heard your question, and I also said I didn't hear it get answered. But there are also lots of other hands up in the room. Please just do your best. I, I believe, though, there was an answer from the supervisor who said there's no application pending before the town. That's great. Okay. That's, that's that the answer was, for that. That wasn't that wasn't okay, well, I, I came in in the middle here because, because this group is losing a little bit of your self control. I'm telling you, this is first and foremost a university. And I'm urging you to show students how respectful, deliberative conversations happens in a university. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Okay, fine. Adrian? I'll clarify the question because I, I have the same question. Um, I, I know I, I'm going to do my best, though. Um, and with, my question is, um, which I think is part of what Georgette was also asking, is if we have two rail terminals, this is really, I think, for days, I think, Two rail terminals approved. We have the one in Brentwood and the one in Nesbitt. How many do we need? Mm -hmm. I never see when I don't know what says we have proposals and But hey, Adrian, if, if I, if I, if I may, I'm sorry. The purpose of, of today, seriously, the goal was on zero waste. We're, we're going to drill down into one or two specific projects. We're talking about a major challenge here for Long Island. We're trying to talk about overall how we address this. I don't think it's productive to start focusing on any one specific project. I just want to put the question out there. Even if we don't have an answer for today, is part of how we manage this, John, I love them. It's part of how we manage this is knowing what we need, right? That's what I'm saying. We have to know what we need in infrastructure in order to get the right amount of infrastructure. And that's, I think that's a, a legitimate question for today's discussion. That, that, that'll be addressed. Okay, yeah. fine. It is. Yes, oh, yes, sir. To the West Marshall to respond. Sorry, Greg. Uh, Mark Udelman. Uh, I work at Stony Brook University. Been here 24 years. I've been in the recycling solid waste field over 30. And one of my first career jobs was uh, the regional planner in Massachusetts. I'm a Long Islander, but I worked for five years in 95 pounds of city, city of Boston. 
and one of the things that we did back then was we banned items going through points of disposal. And we also were dealing back then with market development. I was more a regulator. Uh, but glass was a big issue, a big question mark 30 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. I am so surprised that all these years later, I've been in the field all along, and um, glass is still an issue. But I do have a question for our good friend Will and others that do the processing of the recyclables, and they on their own do what they can with market development and trying to find places for glass. And I'll be real, you know, uh, and, and I and I know back then with Massachusetts, beneficial use was simply taking the aggregate as a daily cover for landfills. And I yeah. just stuck as a professional with not just glass, folks, um, plastics so prevailing in our society at large, all of us, number one and number two, and number five recently, but that's it. And it's a huge void. I'm hearing this again and again in conferences and different things. I think it's great we're doing, um, you know, uh, legislation to put the onus on those that produce the waste. But I think there's a real lag in market development. We still got all these other plastics going to the merch or not. There's really no market for it. Yeah, but if, if there's no return, if somebody is not going to get those materials, if I may, okay, if they have, I have a little experience in this, if they have to provide X amount of dollars to process the material to get it into a reasonably recyclable form, it can cost them X dollars and they're going to get 0.1 X back in a sale. It's not going to work. So that's why the free market is out there, but it's cost them too much. You have to, to collect it, to clean it, to process it. I, and the, and the, and the glass itself, same thing. The glass, you had to separate the colors. You, can, right. you can't have a mix coming sure. mixed together. Yes. May I, may I continue a little bit more? Go ahead. So one of the things that's a void here, and it's nobody's fault, nobody, nobody showed all the burden, even in Stony Brook and the University at large, we've got people learning to do engineering and design. But I remember being a part of the scrap industry years ago. They were saying 30 years ago, we need to design for sustainability. It's still lagging. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of good discussion here. But I'm stuck at that glad isn't. There's not solutions today. Plastics, if we're going to continue to manufacture plastics of all different resins and composites, well, how is that tying in? I think that's a real gap as we move along in this process trying to find solutions. It isn't just off benefits and economic return. There's some real questions here that have been going on for my entire career. Candidly, okay, been involved. Way back when, I have seven U.S. patents on recycling technology. You can process the glass out, but what do you have left? If you want to convert it back to the original form, you have to separate the flint from the brown from the green, okay? What happens when you get glass? It breaks. It breaks. So you wind up with aggregates. The economics are not there. Landfill cover, yes. Drainage materials for subsurface, et cetera, okay? Sure. But the economics are not there. That's the economics, you can't eliminate that. So That's we have a point point yes. question. Yep. We have appointments to take, but if they want, we'd be happy to come back and have uh, another okay. seminar at any time. Sure. Okay. One, last, sure. one last question here. No, no, no. I, I do want to Yes, yes sir. I got it. I got it. I got it. I know you, John, years ago. Uh, I think you remember me. I don't know if you knew or not. I looked a little different. But uh, uh, I'm I'm a, a, a supporter of the Blar people, and you know I'm Tom Brookhaven okay, president. And uh, what I see, when, you know, there's a there's a lot of issues here. But what is what I think is fundamentally missing here is input from the community. The community is not being heard. 
I know the people who some of the people who have spoken here are people who I don't live. I live in Stony Brook. Okay, I'm 25 miles from that landfill. You know, most of the people in my community where I live, they don't even know where the garbage goes. You know, but because I've I worked with the DEC for 15 years, I don't know if I know you, Dave, from back then, but uh, but I was there. I left in '99. Right. So. Uh, but, but at least with respect to to the problem here immediately on uh, in in the town of Brookhaven, the community is not being heard. With all due respect, uh, Supervisor uh, they feel they feel they feel they feel they feel unheard. They feel unheard, and so in and I I, I applaud your 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 efforts, you know, among your supervisors. But among the supervisors is one thing. But that doesn't have input from the community. Right. You know, that does not have community, especially for those who live in proximity, <laughs> near proximity to the landfill. So if anything, if, if I could just make that one suggestion is you get whatever you end up doing, you know, you want to collaborate, that's great, that's wonderful, but you cannot exclude the, the, the public. I actually thought that was the genesis of the of the landfill closing was the supervisor and the town board. Heard the community, and that was the reason why they didn't they didn't expand. It. That was my understanding. One last one, then we have to wrap up for supervisors. Yes, ma'am, back there. Sorry. Um, there's one thing. Your, your name and, and my name living. is Monique Fitzgerald. I'm from North Southport, and I've been before the town board several times talking about this issue and how we are lacking a regional zero waste plan in our town for for many many years as. Um, Mr. Vitale just pointed out, um, and we constantly, like you said, get ignored. Um, the point is, I hear everything that you all are saying, but like I said before, this is very corporate, it's a corporate um, uh, viewpoint, and the problem with that is you, you're talking about aggregate of ash, ash is toxic, and we should not be talking about aggregating ash. But that's because we're listening to Covanta. So again, we need to listen to the community who are being affected. All right. So I, I applaud the regional situation we got right here, but it's not inclusive enough. We need the community. Uh, we need First Nations here. We don't have that representation until we have it. We're going to keep saying the same thing. So um, we're going to keep showing up. And, and doing the same process. So I know it is boring to some of you. It may get boring to some of you that have heard it already, but that is where we start this process and that's how we come up with the solution. Without that, we're gonna have this problem um, uh, coming up over and over again in different ways. So we have to get to the point where we are addressing and we are working with the community to address these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank all our panelists here today. If I may, listen. You all can see this is to be continued. So, thank you. See you.